it's your house. So you go the way you want. Okay, I'm gonna think. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to an, a very exciting day. Um, thanks to uh, Stephen Rothberg and Whitney, that together they created this wonderful conference for us. So welcome, enjoy the day. And I wanna thank Whitney and allow her to say a few words. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Whitney. I work uh, at here at Google. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we love working with College Recruiter and we've been super excited for today. And uh, I'm really fortunate to be on a team that thinks all day about how to help people find jobs and how to help companies hire. So it's really exciting to have an audience here that kind of represents both of those sides uh, and have you all here today. So really excited for the discussion and the content and uh, thanks to College Recruiter for being great partners. Yeah. Thanks so much. So um, hopefully I introduced myself. I'm Faith Rothberg and I'm the CEO of College Recruiter. Um, that would have been probably the right way to start. Um, so today we're gonna, um, just to get a few of the logistics out of the way, um, we are live broadcasting this event um, and the link for it is uh, www.collegerecruiter dot com slash bootcamp at Google. So um, if you want to tell any of your friends who weren't able to make it, um, send them the link. That'd be awesome. Um, Alio is sponsoring uh, the live stream. And uh, thanks to Alio for doing that. Um, and then let's see what else we. All right. So um, after, after I do the welcome, and um, then Stephen Rothwell will be coming up and spending a few minutes talking about what is AI so that we can get everybody kind of on the same page. Um, there's so many definitions out there, kind of help us focus on what we're all trying to talk about today. Um, and then we have three amazing speakers with panels to follow um, and a wonderful lunch that's uh, sponsored by Google. Um, it's so great to be able to be here, so thank you so much. And um, then each of those panels will have time for questions as well. Um, so here's the sponsors. Um, again, Google for hosting and catering. We've got um, the uh, Association of Talent Acquisition Professionals Career Crossroads. Um, and Jive that are uh, sponsoring, which is great. Um, TalentNet uh, sponsored a wonderful reception last night. I wish a few more of you could have made it, but we had a great time with the people that were there. So thanks to TalentNet. Uh, Zap Info is sponsoring Alexander Levitt's book. Um, hopefully you guys saw that out there and picked up a copy. Um, and then she'll be speaking as the second speaker. Um, and then, uh, Alio, like I said, is sponsoring the live stream, and we thank them for that. Uh, so on to the day. Oh, and I almost forgot to thank Peter Clayton um, and Jolie from Total Picture. They're the ones actually doing the work. Um, you'll see them busily trying to take your picture. Um, and then... Uh, they will also be offering three-minute inter interviews during the break. So if you'd like to do that for your company, um, you'll be able to get that clip. We'll be, we'll be pushing it out through social media on College Recruiter as well. Um, so that's a good way to get uh, a little bit of branding for your company. Um, and then, uh, again, we have the live stream. Yeah. All right. Last little bit, I think. Uh, tweeting at CR Bootcamp. Um, please tweet. Um, if you're out there and you want to ask questions on the live stream, please feel free to tweet and ask questions, right, during the day. Um, and then, as always at these conferences, I always tell people, if you have, if you're able to take three takeaways um, along throughout the day back to your company to try to do something new um, or test out uh, something people are talking about, um, 
then it's a successful day. So just keep that in mind at the beginning. What are, what are the three takeaways I can take for the day um, to really get something out of this moving forward? Um, and then we would love it if you don't want to bring your lanyard home to your children like some people have done in the past. Um, we would love it if you just left it behind at the end of the day. Um, reuse, recycle, right? So... All right, and now here he is. Uh, I'd like to introduce Stephen Rothberg. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. I think you need to. Thanks. So um, I'm the founder of College Recruiter. Really appreciate everybody being here today. Um, the um, true story um, at one of our previous conferences, um, a friend of ours uh, went home with her lanyard, which is great. Some people collect them, give them to their kids, whatever. Um, she has twin year old boy, twin boys. Um, and as boys like to do, they fight. And it was an excuse for them to fight. So she sends me an email. It's like, is there any way that you can send me a second lanyard so I can give one to each of them? Um, and then they wore these. I think they're smarter than this. I don't know why they did it. But they wore these to school for like the next three weeks. And she said it was like the greatest present anybody's ever given them, which is kind of sad um, for the kids, I suppose. Um, so before we get into um, too much of the uh, content today, um, don't worry about um, trying to decipher flowcharts like this as to exactly what is AI. Um, and for recruiting, um, we're going to be talking about it at a little bit of a higher level, sort of how organizations are using it, the sort of products that Google's offering, how College Recruiter uses it, et cetera. So I think it'll be pretty enlightening for those who don't know that much about AI, exactly what it is, how employers and in uh, the HR tech industry is 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 beginning to offer this. Um, but really, when I think of um, AI, um, there are a couple of definitions. Uh, the first one I'm not even gonna bother reading because I can't make it through that definition without my head exploding. Um, I, I look at it as, as intelligence that's demonstrated by machines, that they can learn, um, that, that um, it's not just through programming, it's through analysis of data, and they get sort of smarter and smarter over time. It's kind of a vague definition, but we're in such the infancy, I don't really think that there's a great definition. Um, our first present pr presentation is going to be by Tarquin Clark of Google. He's going to tell us how Google thinks of it. Um, and I think that is going to be much more important than how College Recruiter thinks of it. Um, a great um, slide or a presentation um, at a presentation that I saw sort of defined AI this way that um, a mosquito, you could say, is, is intelligent. Clearly not at the same level as intelligence as, as people or elephants or whales or whatever, but when a mosquito lands on a hamburger, thinking of all the different components of that burger and how different pieces of meat right beside each other are cooked differently, they look differently, you might use you know lamb or pork or beef or whatever, but the mosquito's smart enough to know that this is food, um, regardless of where on the hamburger it lands. Now, if that mosquito were to you know, go to a movie, it wouldn't be able to understand the movie. And that's kind of what AI is now. We might have an AI product for recruitment that does a fantastic job for employment recruitment, but doesn't know anything about recruitment in terms of um, getting students to enroll in a college. Um, so recruitment is not recruitment either. Um, college recruiter, we're focused much more on the employment side, by the way. We believe that every student and recent grad deserves a great career. We're a job search site that um, mostly large employers advertise their job openings with. This is kind of everybody's fear. Um, there have been lots of uh, stories in the news over the last few months about AI and how it's being used in employment and some of the failures and some of the successes. Um, I don't think we're going to get here, and I'm not going to give you my Arnold impersonation because my wife and our CEO is in, is in the room. Um, but um, for those geeks um, here, um, you probably know this, Star Trek Next Generation. My hope is that artificial intelligence hundreds of years from now that will evolve into um, or have you know, data um, type people where they work side by side with us. They're not us. We can identify them, um, but they really contribute um, to our well-being. So um, with that, um, where do we have Tarquin? There's Tarquin. So um, we're going to have Tarquin Clark from Google come up and give you the first real presentation. Thank you. So I kind of do want to hear your impersonation. But... You don't. Trust me, you don't. 
So good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. And also thank you to the college recruiter team uh, for putting on this um, wonderful schedule. Uh, we have quite a, a, a good event planned today, and um, we're very excited to, uh, to be a part of that. So my name is Tarquin Clark. Um, I lead the go-to-market team for our talent solution products at Google Cloud. I'm super excited to be moderating um, a panel shortly with our esteemed panelists who are sitting uh, in the front row here. Uh, we have um, quite the group of industry experts. We have Jane Kettles from Great People. Uh, we have uh, Joe Essenfeld from Jibe, uh, Justin Lumby uh, from TalentNet, and Rupa Schneer from Symphony Talent. You know, what brings us all together here today is our shared passion in and interest, I should say, in better connecting job seekers with jobs. And we're going to be talking about the role that AI can play in doing just that. Before we get to the panel discussion, we're gonna take a quick look at machine learning and some of the advances made in recent years to ultimately make our lives a whole lot easier. So machine learning is one branch in the field of artificial intelligence. It's a way to solve problems without explicitly codifying a solution. And it's a way to build a system that improves itself over time with more data and experience. At high level, machine learning is teaching computers to recognize patterns in the same way our brain does. So as humans, just as it's easier for us to distinguish the difference between a cat and a dog, it's actually much more difficult to teach a computer to do the same thing. In order to help train computers to think more like humans, we use a technology called neural networks. A neural network is essentially a mathematical model that works in a similar fashion to our brains. It takes an input through a series of processing steps in order to generate the output. The first neural network was developed around 60 years ago, in 1957. Commissioned by the U United States Office of Naval Research, the perceptron, which you can see here, demonstrated an ability to identify different shapes. So often when people talk about AI and machine learning, they think it's only for experts. And certainly back then, if you wanted to work on ML, you needed access to extensive academic research and computing resources. But if we fast forward to today, we can see that just in the last five to 10 years, the number of products using ML has grown dramatically. Here you can see just a few products at Google now using AI. And it's because we've experienced the value of this technology firsthand that we believe that machine learning is a critical cloud service. Our teams have been busy building machine learning tools and infrastructure for the 22 million developers in the world, regardless of the level of their ML expertise. So when building these models, the key is to train the neural network to produce increasingly accurate results. So for example, in this image you see here, we might train a neural network on millions of photographs, which we label so that it's able to recognize, for example, people, places, or things. The photo at the top, you can see here, is labeled cat. <coughs> we feed the photo through the network with each layer designed to identify different features. The first layer might simply be looking at the pixels in the photograph. The end result is an output, and in doing this, we're training the network to recognize the image as a cat. The next photo is a dog, and so on. So after the neural network has been trained, we can then use it to label images that it has never seen before. In this example, the network is designed to determine if the input image is a cat or a dog. As you can see, the network takes in the, the, the image, processes it, processes it through a series of different layers, and then correctly outputs with the label dog. Often this is with a confidence score based on a threshold that's been set. 
So that's a very quick summary of machine learning, but how can we use it to improve our businesses? According to industry analyst firm IDC, 90% of data, 90% of enterprise data, I should say, is unstructured. So unstructured data is mostly human-generated um, textual data, and it comes in many different languages. It comes from documents such as projects and research reports, internal and external publications, product descriptions, work and governance procedures, and of course, emails. When you add semi-structured data, such as log files and other machine-generated data, we can start to gain a picture of the vast quantities of data that remains untreated today. With machine learning, companies now have the tools to make sense of this unstructured data. One example of that unstructured data is photographs. This is an image of, from Google Street View. Using machine learning, the maps team were able to identify different types of unstructured data within these images and then make it useful. For example, you can see the street name, traffic signals, business names, and so on. The true value of these images was only later recognized when ML was applied to it. And it created a significant improvement in the product itself for all of the end users to benefit from. I'm willing to bet that your respective organizations have similarly valuable data, which when ML is applied, you can unlock the value. In Google Photos, we enable people to quickly find images simply by searching for them. With Google Translate, we're able to look at an image, in this case an exit sign, and then provide the output in multiple different languages. This is super handy when you're traveling in a foreign country, and what's more, the model is downloaded onto your phone, so it doesn't actually require internet connectivity. In Gmail, 12% of, of responses now sent on mobile are via smart reply. And the new smart compose feature is helping to save people from typing more than a billion characters every single week. In addition, machine learning is blocking more than 10 million spam messages every minute. Think about that. In the same amount of time it takes you to tie your shoelaces or peel an orange, 10 million spam email messages have been blocked. So how does this all apply with job search and, and helping folks find a job? So when we think about job search, um, it's really, you know, searching for a job is one of the most consequential searches most of us will do in our lifetime. Gallup actually in 2017 also reported that more than half of US employees are actively looking for a job or watching job openings. Over the years, we know that the mechanics of job search have changed. As new technologies have emerged and matured, and you can see here going from offline with newspaper and print onto online, and you have job boards, job aggregators, career sites, and social sites. Yet it's actually hard to find evidence pointing to an increase of inefficiency of matching between jobs and job seekers. In fact, there's actually some evidence to suggest that the job market has become less efficient. <coughs> One of the labor market indicators used by economists is called the beverage curve that you see here. This shows the relationship between unemployment and the job vacancy rate. Other things being equal, an increase in unemployment rate whilst the vacancy rate drops, in other words, more people are looking for jobs and more jobs are available, suggests a deterioration in the matching and hiring process in the economy. What economists call an outward shift in the beverage curve, and you can see that on the right-hand side there. Although the shifts in the beverage curve during the 21st century are not particularly large by historical standards, directionally, the observed shifts suggest that, if anything, job ma matching in the labor market has actually become less efficient. 
So there's many plausible explanations why technological advances uh, do not seem to increase job mar uh, market efficiency. One reason for this is as technology makes it easier for job seekers to apply for jobs, they actually end up applying for many more jobs, often jobs that they're not qualified for. This then shifts uh, uh, the, the kind of the volume onto employers uh, who have to now sift through a growing number of applicants uh, who are a, essentially a poor fit for the job. We started first exploring this notion in 2012, and we learned firsthand that machine learning can more efficiently match job seekers with jobs. So back then, so around six, six years ago, we were hiring approximately uh, 10,000 people a year. Our senior vice president of people operations and our VP of staffing set forth the challenge to explore how we might 10x our hiring. We looked at all the different sources of hire and we found the career site to be the most scalable source we had with millions of visitors that come by every single month. In order to improve the pass-through rate, we started off by adding some advanced features to allow job, job seekers to drill into the results that they saw. After that, we began tuning the search algorithm and quickly found that there are many nuances to job search on both the job seeker side and the employer side. The first problem is that it's really easy to misunderstand the intent of the job seeker when you use keyword search. There's a few examples you can see up on the screen. So searching for dental assistant, for example, often returns assistant roles with dental benefits. The role benefits manager, we know, everyone in this room, to be a role that exists within human resources. However, the search service is looking for any manager job with benefits. Often manager jobs include benefits in the job description, and so the search service returns these roles. Similarly, um, if you search for server in San Jose, we know that the job seeker is actually looking for a role within restaurant and hospitality, except the search service is returning SQL Server administrator jobs for that location. Assuming all of the relevance uh, issue results on the left-hand side are addressed, you then run into another problem that we call the secondary role issue, which is really impacts seniority. So often within job descriptions, you see other roles included. So for example, an administrative assistant might report to a vice president, and a, um, a financial analyst might generate reports for the CFO. The second issue is on the employer side, in the sense that job, job titles don't actually make a lot of sense to anyone other than the hiring manager. On the right, you can see a list of job titles. They're confusing at best. So when you actually look at the query stream of what job seekers are searching for, and then when you look at what the job titles that uh, employers have, you can really, it really, really, truly highlights the issue that job seekers and employers are speaking two completely different languages. And if you have a search technology and a search service that's trying to match on the search terms that are being used, these two worlds never meet. The first result you see up there, Reckon Asset Prop 1, is actually a recovery and asset protection manager. Even decoded, that's kind of confusing. It's what you and I might know as a security guard. So if you're a security guard, <laughs> I see a very shocked face in the audience, so <laughs> it's a great look. Um, for a security guard, if you're searching for security guard on a company website or on a job board, et cetera, um, this role would never be returned because it, the search service cannot find this in the, uh, in the job description. So in order to address these challenges, we realized we could train models to understand jobs, companies, people, skills, and education. And so the first iteration of what is now our neural network that underpins our talent solution products was born. You can think of it really as a two-sided matching engine. It takes a resume or other form of candidate profile and a job description, and then runs them through a set of algorithms to produce the best possible match. 
It's really all about understanding the semantics that exist around people and the semantics that exist around jobs. And then using the power of machine learning to make the best match possible. Today, companies such as CareerBuilder, Marriott, and College Recruiter are using the service and reporting significant gains. This is the very same model that we used on our own career site and still to this day do uh, that has driven over a 28% incre increase in our pass-through rate. So as an example, uh, Marriott hires over 100,000 people every single year. They weren't getting a lot of applicants to many of their open roles on their career site. They have lots of different brands within the uh, organization. And interestingly, the job titles for people who clean guest rooms uh, differ based on the brand. So for the Marriott, the role is called housekeeper. At the Westin, it's called house attendant. And at the more trendy W, it's called a room stylist. After working with the Jibe team to implement Talent Solution Job Search, the Marriott Career site now returns, as you can see, multiple relevant roles for the more generic queries such as housekeeper. What's more, Marriott in reported an increase in 23% um, of applicants and reduced time to hire by 17%. Our friends here at College Recruiter, also early adopters of the product, uh, Talent Solution Job Search, um, have shared some great numbers as well. So the College Recruiter team has seen a 20% increase in click-through rate from job search to job de detail, in addition to deeper engagement on the site. So that's the job seeker side. On the recruiter side, Recruiters actually have a very tough job in trying to find great matches to roles. Often the tools that they have at their disposal let them down. And so we've developed a service that applicant tracking systems and other products can plug in to use to help power the search and also make the experience much more human. We've heard from many different recruiters that past candidates are the first place to look when sourcing for new jobs. At Google, we actually did an experiment a few years back. We analyzed 300,000 resumes from rejected software engineers, and we re-ran 10,000 of them through the process again. 150 people were hired. So the yield of 1.5% was six, six times greater than our regular recruiting yield of 0.25%. And if this is an interesting study, you can read all about it in uh, the book, Work Rules, by our former SVP of People Operations, Laszlo Bach. Overall, the data shows that companies find existing candidates to be the second best source of hire after referrals. <coughs> we see this actually play out in our hire product, where past candidates that have been found using the profile search service have a 40% greater chance of being hired. So integrating this technology into sourcing products ultimately saves recruiters time. Users no longer have to compose these rather complex Boolean searches that you see here in order to find the right role, the right candidates. Instead, the user just types in exactly what they're looking for, and we let the machines do the rest. So we've been using our profile search product within Hire uh, since May with great results. And just last week, we made it generally available to all customers. This is actually a tweet from a higher customer just last month <laughs> and a great example of how artificial intelligence can work alongside us each and every day in our careers, allowing us to spend less time in apps and more time with people. Before we close out, I just would like to demonstrate the importance of inclusiveness and taking steps to guard against reinforcing existing inequalities in job matching. AI is, after all, about pattern recognition. A potential risk is the data used to train and develop the models might contain human bias. To highlight this, let's do a quick exercise. If everyone in the room 
could imagine a shoe. Okay, so now raise your hand if you are thinking of a sneaker. It's a good number of hands. Um, heels? Boots? Any Brits with Wellington boots? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, excellent. Okay, so um, I actually was kind of close, but I think Heels won that, right? Yeah, okay, so given the majority of people in the room raised their hands for Heels, we've actually immediately introduced a bias. So bias can come in three different forms. First of all, you have selection bias, which is from sampling in different data sources that are used. Next, there's latent bias, which is when the model is, is only shown a specific example. So for example, for what, what we just proved out in the room, if, if all shoes are labeled as heels, the model will be biased towards heels and not actually label sneakers correctly. And finally, there's interaction bias, which occurs when the users interact with the model. In this room, for example, if everyone submitted a pair of heels in a game, then that model would learn from that activity and then be biased towards heels. So it's really re important to remember that any creator or influencer of technology has a responsibility to develop with inclusion as part of the design. And ultimately, we believe AI will have the greatest impact when everyone can access it and it's built with everyone's benefit in mind. So with that, I'd like to invite our panelists up to uh, take a seat. And do we have microphones? Here we go. Is this on? Here we go. Hello. Great. So um, perhaps, uh, Jane, if you'd like to get Certainly. Just, uh, introduce yourself. Sure. And, uh, Hi, everybody. My name is Jane Kettles. I am co-founder and chief product officer at Great People. Uh, Great People offers our customers the ability to find, engage, and hire the best talent. Uh, we focus on talent CRM, recruitment marketing, and ATS. Uh, very excited to be here. We do have a component that helps uh, campus recruiters manage uh, on-site campus event, and uh, really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Jane. I'm Rupesh Nair. I'm the president and CEO of Symphony Talent. Uh, Symphony Talent has a talent marketing product, which, <clears throat> which basically provides an AI-driven, personalized uh, experience for candidates, recruiters, and employees. And so excited to be here talking about this topic. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello. Uh, Justin Lumbia. I'm the vice president of technology strategy with Talnet and a partner. Um, Talnet is an enterprise recruitment platform uh, used for talent attraction and engagement of top talent, uh, as well as for our recruitment partners um, who use our tool and, and pro predominantly as an ATS um, uh, for seeking out and identifying with the best candidates. And we're happy to be here today talking about uh, machine learning and some of these advances with Google. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm Joe Essenfeld, CEO and founder of Jibe. Uh, Jibe makes enterprise SaaS for career sites. So we power a lot of the high volume um, career sites around the world for companies like FedEx, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Comcast, and PepsiCo. And we were excited to bring out some AI from Google with FedEx uh, a couple years ago and been really kind of cool to see the emotional connection of how it can improve the actual job search for job seekers. So it's been a great experience. Thanks. Super. So um, we actually have a microphone just there if you have it. We'd like to, the panelists really want to have a very open uh, debate. So the floor is immediately open for questions. Uh, we have a microphone right there if you could just line up behind it. Um, before you ask your question, when it's your turn, please do just state your name um, and the company you're from. Uh, and, and then also the, the, the panelists that you'd like to direct the question specifically to. So do we have any uh, initial takers? Oh, I should actually say that our panel discussion is about AI, the use of AI in recruiting. <laughs> Initial questions? Excellent. Would you like to? Uh, thank you very much.
Yeah, my name's Alan Tidwell. I'm from Shanda Asset Management in Menlo Park. My question is just about low volume. If we have a low volume of recruiting um, and we don't have a large database of previous applicants, how can we use AI to improve our process and help us get better hiring results? Does anyone, I mean, each of you has customers with uh, this very experience, so they want to... Uh, sure. So I think um, one of the things that's um, important to appreciate is in many of the models that we're using today, and certainly um, the ones where we, we partner with Google, um, many of these models are developed out of large aggregate uh, sets of, of data. Um, so not necessarily um, just specific to one employer or a small employer. Um, and I think so certainly you can you can benefit um, from that sort of stratified and, and large data set. Um, so very much I think there's still a use case to use this within smaller organizations. Um, certainly a, a benefit if you've got a lot of uh, data available to you, um, but still uh, a, a lot of value I think um, even in a small environment as well, just because of the, the larger data set that you're benefiting from. Yeah, and, and just to add on, when, when you're using low volume, you still have the searches which your candidates are doing which can learn from all the data set from uh, gathered from the rest of the organizations and also, and purely from an experience perspective, because low volume, you need to provide that, you know, seamless experience to your candidate. AI can be used, uh, you know, to improve that also. Yeah, I also think um, targeting those data sets and leveraging AI, you're casting a, a larger net. Uh, you may not bring back your traditional uh, set of, uh, titles or job titles. It may be people who have more of an aptitude for that role. So there may be more of an opportunity for the recruiters to do selling um, as opposed to sourcing. Great. And oh, just before, just as you're walking around, um, have any of your customers um, raised this specific challenge with you today or? <laughs> I think the biggest thing is competition, probably, especially as it relates to uh, campus and and uh, new hire uh, internships, et cetera. Yeah. So competition is big. Um, reducing the friction kind of mm -hmm. in the process, and certainly intelligent automation can help you in those areas. Right. Yeah, and the related uh, problem, obviously, is that you're kind of, it's you know, I would like to use the economist term, like the lemons problem, right? When you kind of have lots of jobs and lots of people, you're kind of trying to figure out what's the best match. And that's been the biggest problem which our, our you know, uh, clients are trying to solve because they, they can only, even in the low volume case, they can only go to certain places right now. They cannot reach out, specifically in terms of college recruitment, they cannot reach out to the larger volume. What, you know, what we are able to solve with these solutions is the fact that now you can actually increase your reach significantly and and then use AI to really kind of figure out who are the candidates you want to really talk to, rather than being very selective on kind of reaching out to specific colleges or specific people uh, around in the network. Okay, next question. So now the AI has been adding a lot of value to the recruitment and there is no doubts about it. Uh, there are so many technical solutions which different companies are offering using AI technology. So somebody, some comp recruiting group who is just starting on looking at different technical solutions, what are some of the factors they should consider before selecting a specific tool or going that route? I'm happy to start this one. I, I think the most important thing is to define the problem that you're trying to solve first. Um, so don't get the technology looking for a problem, get a problem looking for technology. And I think if you're able to do that successfully, um, and then you see how AI can come in and help solve that better and faster, I think you'll win. I think kind of tying this back to the lower volume question, you know, we've seen lower volume sometimes mean don't use AI, don't use technology. If there's a small enough data set as Tarquin said earlier, I think Steven said earlier, you know, AI is not as smart as our own brain. So if you can still leverage yourself, then let's not take ourselves out of the equation yet until it makes really a lot of sense. And that usually happens at scale. Yeah, I think just to add to the selection, and I would agree um, to, to focus on the problem um, in identifying a solution. Um, and often that becomes um, certainly with the enterprise as well is looking at, you know, sort of once you've identified um, what that problem is and you're now looking for technology, um, but also looking at the incumbent ecosystem that you have. 
um, and how is this going to play with existing processes and workflows um, and other the technology environment that you're operating in, um, and it's going to be suitable and not um, uh, you know, create new fragmented processes. Yeah, and recruitment is pretty much, if you think about your recruitment life cycle, like an overall marketing life cycle, you kind of identify where your problem exists. Is it in the top of the funnel? Use AI to solve that. Is it that you have too many candidates? Let's use AI to kind of you know, na you narrow things down. If you're having issues with engagement, try to solve that, right? So if you hear about these tools in the, you know, around, they're solving specific issues, whether it's the searching, whether it's the, you know, how I'm engaging with the candidate or even creating that uh, volume, which you need, right? So identify what the problem is again, but you can think about it as the life cycle and try to solve for it. Yeah, I think you need to look at the foundation of your processes and make sure that there's a framework for checks and balances to understand if there's correctional steps that you need to take, identifying the factors that based on standardization may uh, impact results. Uh, as we learned, machines learn patterns and they're constantly rerunning those patterns. So I think just having awareness uh, of what's happening with the different um, uh, transactional uh, steps in your process and how you're going to enable AI and just have a foundation for uh, those checks and balances I think are important at the beginning. Right. I think it's actually a, a really great question that probably a lot of people and a lot of organizations actually have is, um, you know, there's, there's many different places you can apply AI. Certainly, I, I was walking the, the floor at HR Tech, and there's an awful lot of products and solutions uh, offered this year and um, increasingly uh, around AI. So um, what, what would you recommend specifically to an organization that comes to, to your, your companies? Um, you know, with some challenges or problems, you know, and how do you get started? You know, because often with new technology, it's more of a trust trust issue. And, uh, you know, once you get up and running with something, then, you know, you feel a lot more comfortable and then you can kind of broaden and, and go on to apply in different places once that's been established. Yeah, and I think you need to look at um, your, your process and um, where there's an opportunity to be flexible that you could potentially level uh, leverage AI, um, but you know you don't have to do it all from the ground up. Yep. You need to have some flexibility and and then measure and see where it's impacting, uh, where your baselines are and what the lift is you're getting. Yeah, and since this is a college recruiting event, maybe I can focus a little bit on the specific yep. problems you know as college recruiters or, or or you might be facing and how to solve for that. Obviously, searching is one of the biggest problems, right? And Tarkin talked a little bit about it. Your uh, graduate comes onto your website, your candidate portal, and they're looking for a job. I think that's when making, it, making that very specific and focusing on that and bringing in AI is something you can bring in pretty quickly because as a graduate, I'm, I, I frankly sometimes don't know what I'm looking for and my searches are a little bit more vaguer and kind of giving that experience to your candidate who's like looking for that job is the first thing you can easily solve. The second piece, when you think about how do you manage your events, uh, is it is it virtual event? Is it basically is it a very specific uh, you know physical event? And how to how to manage that? And how do we use AI to then have those conversations pre and post those events? Right? Because at the end of the day, the use of AI is to do what humans can do, but at scale. Right? So how do you kind of reach <laughs> train your AI to kind of understand that and then reach that scale which you need to. But at the end of the day, you still as a recruiter are focused on really having those human conversations and like really managing that final, uh, you know, matching. Because at the end of the day, AI can only get you so far from a matching perspective. Yeah, maybe just um, I can address this from a recruitment perspective. We have the benefit of working with a large pool of recruiters, um, both in defining uh, use cases for our product, but also later on when we go through uh, user acceptance testing on um, different features that we've we've developed. Um, and one of the things I know I know we were talking before about um, pass through rates and 1.5 percent, and at Google even sort of 0.25. Um, so if you think traditionally, um, th there's a lot of sort of um, tedious and task-based sort of administrative work. Uh, that a recruiter can go through in identifying, you know, what, whether it's somebody coming out as a freshman grad out of college um, or whether it's a professional. Um, so for us, it's, it's really not about um, sort of taking away from the recruiter's experience, but really adding uh, a net benefit to it um, and allowing them to focus more 
on the strategic pieces of their role um, and being more of a strategic talent advisor um, and being able to get out there into the market and understand um, some of those new grads coming out of school um, and, and what sort of makes them great instead of kind of click, click, click on you know, 99 resumes that are irrelevant um, for your role. So that's really where we see sort of a benefit uh, specifically to recruiters. Yeah, I think it's all about maximizing the value for the time investment that you're going to put in to solve this problem. So when we work with typically larger employers, we want to understand what people they need to recruit that's actually going to make a business impact, that's going to get noticed all around the organization, and then understand the process and problems around those. So we just want to concentrate that value so the time spent investing in technology is going to give a really good noticeable return uh, and then result in more projects and more investment. So. We'll try and start with the highest value and go from there. Super, thanks. We have a few more questions. Great. Uh, my name is oops, my name my name is Keith Cressy. I'm with Duffin Phelps. Um, my question is in regards for AI in regards to diversity hiring uh, at Duffin Phelps. Uh, we really look to kind of focus on that, and I want to see kind of how AI can you know help us with those efforts. So again, focusing on the problem at this point, the problem you're trying to solve is a specific type of candidate at the end of the day, which you want to kind of get into the, get into the portfolio or get into your life cycle. So when you think about the recruiter side of AI, uh, you can start in without thinking about, you know, obviously there are certain aspects around what data and what not to use and things like that. And we can get to it. For example, when we started using last name and first name as part of AI, it started making predictions around, we started making more hires similar to a certain hire as compared to the other, right? So as you train the AI, kind of ensuring that, you know, it doesn't have the bias is important. But in this use case, you're trying to look for, let's say, a specific type of skill set, let's say military, right? Or uh, in that case, what you're really training the AI at that point, and I'm sure most of the tools we, are, we, we work with, provide the capability to kind of train the AI on what you're looking for. So if you're looking for more of a military type hire, you're kind of telling the AI to look for more of the, that and try to sort your candidates based on that. So kind of getting through, one of the aspects is of getting through the mass and trying to figure out the candidates you're looking for who are more suited to your diversity needs is one. Right? The second aspect is the conversations you're having. I think it's important part of the AI is around what type of conversations you want to have as a company and, and curating content in that area and letting AI kind of Assimilate, you know, push it through to, to the people so that then people who are actually thinking about, you know, that content who are more similar to the way you want people to be hired into the organization can then be, then be leveraged to kind of drive more of that candidates into the volume, right? So again, you can solve it by trying to, question is again, is, are you, is, your, is volume the issue that you want to generate more of those type of candidates? Or is the issue that you want to sort out and figure out those type of candidates and based on that, yeah, it could be used on the top of the funnel or the bottom, you know, mid part of the funnel, depending upon where your problem lies. Right. Um, I can just add quickly. We work with a number of large organizations that have um, different diversity strategies in place, um, and they'll go about it in in different ways. So either they'll have certain sort of, I guess, lead aspects to their strategy, or this will be something that they measure through lag indicators and, and analytics. Um, so if it's more of a um, we'll call it a passive strategy where you're looking at lag analytics, um, then typically for them it's most important that they are exposing themselves uh, to the correct populations and events, um, academic institutions, whatever it is, and then sort of measuring um, based on output on how successful that is. Um, where it would get a little bit, I think, more tricky is if, is if it's sort of on the active lead side, because we're, you know, we're talking right now algorithmically um, about trying to remove bias um, from algorithms. If, if you're going to actively do it sort of from a lead perspective, then you almost need to, with intention, um, insert some level of bias, right, to, to try to promote those results. So we've seen enterprises that approach this from, from sort of both perspectives. Um, I would say sort of the lag is is more prevalent and making sure that sort of they're in the right places and recruiting in the right places and then measuring it. Um, but we are certainly seeing this come up as uh, more of a, you know, active uh, lead strategy as well. Hey, just one last thing to add too, as a caution with AI, I mean, AI is an amplifier of existing behavior. So if you are thinking that you need to have more diversity and change behavior, 
AI, AI may not be the first thing to look at to do that. It might be taking a more conscious approach to change your recruiting process. And then once you establish those changes, then sure, this could potentially amplify that and do that better. But I probably wouldn't start thinking about AI uh, in terms of improving diversity as a first step. Yeah, you have a point there, Drew. And I think using AI for sourcing itself, may not, like kind of using it to sort people out may not be the best place to start. But it, the other aspect of AI is kind of giving that one-on-one -on -one conversation and creating that personalization. So that element is very useful when you're, when you're basically uh, you know, di recruiting in diversity because you're thinking about a specific type of persona and ensuring that you're able to have those right conversations and personalize in that area more than the rest of the areas. So it's not necessarily including, introducing a bias into your sourcing process, but increasing the amount of conversations you are having with a specific persona because, and, and ensuring that it's more one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tanya and I work in government and this question is um, similar. It's related to diversity hiring around disability specifically. If you've adjusted your recruitment strategies and taken different lead measures already to outreach that population and you aren't seeing kind of a, a return in terms of increased applicants, do you have any specific examples around disability, diversity, hiring, inclusion, or even upskilling within companies as applied to AI? And I know it's very particular, but that's, that's sort of what I'm after today. Well, one area that I think could be really interesting is improving the accessibility of career websites. It's like this gray area where there isn't, there aren't very clearly defined standards that everyone has to follow. There are recommendations that people should follow as best practice, and even doing them effectively on responsive design on complicated websites is really hard, um, specifically around screen readers and technology. I think there's a really interesting opportunity for having AI analyze your career sites and make better recommendations of how to make them more accessible. Because this is one of those fuzzy area problems that AI can actually come in and give some insight because of the scale and scope of data and user behavior that would happen on those career sites. So to me, that would be a really cool application of how to do that. And we're seeing a lot more energy around making sure career sites are more accessible in a useful way. And across all of our clients, we're getting asked to do much more rigorous testing. So I think with that type of pull from companies that are willing to invest in it, it could be another area where you could use AI rather than finding people, actually making the quality of their experience better, which would hopefully increase adoption as a result. Yeah, I'd also just add that, um, you know, one of the features we introduced was uh, called commute time. And um, in order to, uh, for this feature to be effective, it was, it was important to understand the location of the, the business. And uh, a lot of organizations weren't actually providing the location of the workplace in their job descriptions. And so, I mean, when you think about that, that seems crazy. You're applying for a job and you don't know where it's going to be. So as an employer, it's, it's kind of, it's a basic level of thing that you should be doing. Um, and, and I think it also holds true. Um, you know, obviously a lot can be achieved with AI. Um, but also making sure that as an employer you're providing the information that's necessary for the job seeker to better understand the role and also better understand what um, facilities that are available um, for a, a future employee that organization. Hi, uh, my name is Derek Zeller. I'm with Engage Talent. Um, one of the things I, I been in the business 23 years. I've been a recruiter, sorcerer, you name it, I've done it. One of the things I'm starting to see in Muscle of Futurist is things like GDPR that's happened in Europe. And now with the privacy concerns with Facebook, the, what LinkedIn just did, uh, just what, the day before Thanksgiving, um, all of your connections, you cannot see their email addresses anymore. It all disappeared. Um, as a sorcerer, I mean, I've heard a lot of inbound. I'm hearing a lot about inbound, and that's you know the whole post and pray thing. As a sourcer, as a person going out and looking for Rupesh, because that's the person I want to have come work for my company, how do you see these privacy laws going to affect AI in recruiting and staffing? Yeah. I'm happy to start. I, I think that in technology, we constantly see trends of decentralization followed by recentralization. And I think as you're seeing some of this privacy, it's forcing some of these sites like LinkedIn to you know, own and control this data and do it a little bit more responsibly than what was being done in a more decentralized model. Um, I remember back when I was on AOL and everything was on one app. 
I had my chat, my web, it, it was all there, it was very convenient. And then it all got broken up into pieces. And in that decentralization, we sacrificed some privacy. And I think as the market is looking to get that privacy back, there's no easy way to solve it. You know, blockchain didn't give us the magic formula where we could all be encrypted on a distributed ledger. So I think we're now gonna look at centralization, trust those players to you know, take care of our data a little bit more responsibly, but it's gonna cause more inconvenience around sourcing. So it might drive you to you know, work closely with LinkedIn to get better ways of contacting those people instead of relying on an email address. So I just think it's related to those two trends that we typically will see. Yeah, I think um, specifically um, uh, with uh, GDPR in mind, um, so GDPR, um, you know, it, it does introduce complexities um, as a technology provider, but certainly also as, as a recruiter as well. Um, you need access to information to contact candidates, et cetera. Um, and when you look at GDPR, it, it really doesn't intend to interrupt or attempt to disrupt those transactions. What really underpins it is a level of transparency and that a job seeker um, that's putting their CV or their resume out, uh, whether it's on a job board or a career site or whatever, is is willing to do so and is is looking to be contacted. Um, and I think it's really trying to prevent where you know misuse of data, um, where that opt-in is not being provided. Um, but I, I would agree that you know there's there's definitely some ambiguity. I mean, it's not been extensively tested, certainly in courts uh, through Europe, anyways. Um, and I, I think there's you know a lot that will come out of it, but um, you know ultimately I think we'll see similar regulations uh, roll out uh, nationally across uh, the U.S. And, and North America as well. Yeah, and one of the areas uh, I think this for the sources specifically, I think it will evolve significantly in the following years is how sources use lists. For example, right now we go in and we grab sometimes, right? People go in and grab and actually sometimes put it into CRM without knowing that whether the candidate is ready to talk to me or not. And, and there is a little bit of, I've seen clients use it in, a, in, a, in different ways and a little bit of ambiguity around that. And that kind of is going to become a little bit more, I think, guarded and, and basically uh, considered, right? So uh, hence, that's why I think we need to focus on those active engagements and not necessarily just getting a list and drop, dropping it and trying to figure that out, but focusing on like, hey, I need to have this active engagement with this this candidate or this person who's potentially a long-term fit for the company and really nurture that. And that's where I think AI tools can help too, right? So you're, you're not necessarily thinking about purely as a list, but as a real engagement. And then, then there's no concern as much about data as long as your tools are centralized and, and focused. Yeah, it's definitely not going away. Uh, I think that we're, we're probably going to get better at the different channels that you have today. So referrals, people who are your silver medalist. Uh, we talked about people who've gone through a process. It's really important not to lose sight of those people and to keep them engaged in an intelligent, automated way. Uh, so we see those trends definitely more of a focused and more robust as it relates to AI. Cool. Super, and I, I think Rupresh uh, touched on this earlier, but um, just interested in uh, Jane, your thoughts on on how AI can be used to help companies uh, more effectively engage with uh, college students and re recent grads. Sure, I think um, leveraging some uh, NLP chat is a, a really great technology to reach out to uh, recent grads or intern opportunities. Uh, I think the ability for uh, a more efficient scheduling component, mm -hmm. uh, leveraging kind of just-in-time uh, technologies. Um, I also think that um, the way that we're evaluating somebody's kind of public profile and making assumptions on kind of capabilities, it's important to present uh, kind of that next generation of AI where you're telling me where my gaps are. So how do I become that, that, that thing in an organization? And um, there's obviously last year, I think to some extent this year in the industry, there's a lot of talk around chatbots. Have any of you got experience with chatbots and seen uh, good benefits from, from them? We have. Um, you know, I think that um, kind of just-in-time information, yeah. I think, is, is really important to capture, um, you know, competition, right, efficiency, less friction. So the ability to give uh, a job seeker the information that they're looking for in real time is very important to get that feedback real uh, real time is important and the next steps in the process um, we see it 
heavily used kind of in the high volume um, most effectively. Um, yeah. yeah, and combining, you know, when you think about chat, right, it's not just about that chatbot interface, but all the conversations you're having, whether through text or WhatsApp or Messenger, and kind of that conversational or the engagement aspect, I, most of our clients are seeing value in that, especially in the college scenario where now assessments are, you know, there are tools available for video interviewing, assessments and things like that, which can put some scoring into your, your connection with the candidate. So there's a scale in the number of people you can reach out to. And then once they have connected with you, that conversation you can have is not now necessarily dependent on a recruiter. Obviously, you quickly figure out who your, you know, gold medalists are or who those best fit candidates are. And you want your recruiter to call them right away so that that connection happens. But then there will be a a set of people who you want to ensure that are are engaged over a period of time. I think we have had we have had significant value in those conversations because some of those might not be ready yet, but maybe a good fit in the future. So kind of managing those pieces, especially in the scale, we have seen value from chat type technologies, which is not purely on a part on the web, which is great, but but also the text messaging and WhatsApp and and Messenger and all those other things, other ways of connecting to the candidates, which has become multi-channel right now. Yeah, I think I think one of the biggest benefits of you know real time communication through a chatbot um, or sort of however you're facilitating it is it's the first sort of entry doorway into the culture of, of the potential employer. Um, and I, I think you know if, if you're a new grad sort of coming into the workforce, um, then one of the most important things you can do is not to just go get sort of the the highest paying job or the best you know sounding title or whatever it is, um, but to really focus on joining an organization um, that you feel is reflective of your of your values and, and who you are, um, and is is a place that ultimately you're going to learn learn because the first you know five ten maybe even even longer years of your career is, is really going to be about learning and growth, not about sort of you know how do I get sort of the the highest paycheck or whatever I I can. And so I think if you look at um, even the other tools that. Um, a lot of sort of the you know, younger generations use now, they're all highly collaborative, um, real-time chat tools. And if you look at historically the recruitment market, um, which has sort of been, you know, post my resume up, apply for a job, and it's this sort of ambiguous black hole. Um, so from our point of view, um, the more that we can enable these sort of real-time collaboration tools within our tool and provide sort of an entryway into the culture of that organization, um, the better the better sort of that new graduate student is going to have a feel for uh, the organization they're joining. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a great point. I think uh, for us, we've seen chatbots be used as a great user research tool. Uh, I think there's some really interesting vision and aspirations in that field. Um, however, what it's exposing are how job seekers actually want to use them. You know, what are the questions being asked? And right now, chatbots can't answer everything. They're just not that advanced. But it gives this insight on what really matters to the people that are on your website because it's this free form way of communicating. So it's a nice way to collect that data. And the companies that are really going to win are going to use that data as an advantage and then make their strategy around what users are asking them for. So it's a good way to do that. Have any of you experienced uh, some surprise findings for the company, your your customers, in after implementing this technology at all? Not so much a surprise, but every question was, "What's the status of my application?" And the, the chatbot <laughs> didn't know any better than the recruiter that was avoiding that question. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Faith. Yes, yeah, so I'm Faith Rothberg from College Recruiter, and we are fortunate today to have some students in the room and also students online. And so um, a student wanted to ask the question, how do I use AI in my job search? Which kind of goes along with what you guys are talking sure, about. Sure, I'll, I'll kick it off. I think the cool thing is, is that that student is using AI in his or her job search already without realizing it. Um, you know, when you go to Google, and start your job search, a lot of those recommendations are based on AI and machine learning of other job seekers. And the actions that you're taking in a small way are incrementally making those results better. Um, so a lot of that is happening transparently, uh, which is nice and it makes that experience better. And now it's also translating onto the career site as well. So off the top of my head, I can't think of a way that that individual student could use AI, but he or she could definitely enjoy the benefit of it being used on a lot of technologies that's available to them that, at this point. Yeah, I would I would echo that, and I think that um, you know we looked at the use case earlier today with um, sort of these ambiguous job titles, um, and if you know you're coming out of school and you've got no idea what that job title means inside of a large organization, it's it's nice just to simply be able to put in 
what you're looking for um, and have relevant results uh, come up. And so I don't think it needs to be as sort of dramatic as you know you are now entering the AI portal, uh, but more but more that um, you know in in all of the tools that you're using every day uh, that the that the results um, and their quality is is becoming enhanced uh, through AI and machine learning. Yeah, and as a student, it's not about how you're using AI. Uh, as I said as Joe and others said, it's it's part of the search experience or it's part of how recruiters and others are going to work. But as a student, I think it will be good to know that these type of things are happening. And hence, I, what do I focus on as a student? Uh, I, I think I see a trend change probably uh, where students should focus more and more on kind of, I think they should be always focused on building skills, right? And kind of documenting those skills so that tools pick it up, right? So I think, I think spent, people spend a lot of time in the past on networking and things like that, which is important. But I would say as a student, think about ensuring that you're building those skills and ensuring that those are documented so that these tools start picking it up and kind of you know, make it part of their search algorithms and things like that. that. That's the only thing I can think about how behavior of students should change as basically AI becomes part of how recruiters work and how students work. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's um, not always how you're going to be found, but how you're going to be evaluated. So taking an inventory of your public profile, uh, just making sure it aligns with the latest, you know, selection uh, tools that are available to companies. Yeah, I, th I think also, you know, there's historically been this um, kind of pattern and behavior to on the employer side to stuff uh, job titles with certain keywords so that they show up in results for certain queries and on the job seeker side stuff your resume with certain keywords. Uh, hopefully with the proliferation of the technology, you know, we can just get back to writing exactly, you know, what you, your, did, yeah. your, <laughs> you, you did. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. Do we have another question? Hi, I'm Sharon I'm from Site Tracker in Palo Alto. Um, I had a follow-up question about an earlier question. It was about um, the factors um, to consider when choosing AI, and it was something that Jane uh, mentioned. Uh, you talked about how when establishing recruiting process and foundation, there should be standardization and checks and balances and correctional processes. Can you elaborate more on that? Sure. Um, you know, I think I think we said that with standardization, there's some. Um, criteria that makes a decision, right? So there's patterns and they get repeated. So I think there needs to be visibility into what those patterns are. I also think that we are in its infancy and there's things like um, personality impact on a team, uh, somebody's experience on uh, you know, the ability to ideate and be innovative. And I don't know how, you know, we'll get there to capture those things, but I think there should be visibility in how your pool is being evaluated um, so that you have the ability to potentially introduce some corrective uh, attributes uh, to that list. Thank you. Yep. Does that make sense? <laughs> oh yeah, um, can you give some examples of maybe like situations that you've encountered where you'd have to you know, implement a correction or maybe biases or personalities? Well, I think there was a big example in the news recently <laughs> was that the uh, the corpus, the brain that was uh, the data set that was leveraged with, I think it was Amazon, right? So uh, it had some biases against females. So uh, all female colleges were not getting, or I think they're getting deprecated kind of inequality uh, return. So I think understanding those levers uh, is important as we venture into this world. But I believe that there has to be a stopgap of, you know, uh, talent qualifiers, meaning people, not necessarily sourcers, who's really understanding the the selections that are being presented, and you know, evaluate fit and all those great things that you need uh, for a good hire. Thank you. Yep. And then, um, you know, obviously, culture is a big piece of every single organization. How are your your customers approaching you at all, asking you for kind of solutions around culture? And yep, Rupesh, do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge part of, you know, at Symphony Talent, especially we do both sides, kind of the messaging and the creative of the creation and the technology. So it's a conversation we have with our clients a lot about kind of how do we build the culture? How do we build that as part of our conversations with the organizations? And 
obviously in the assessment part, there is an aspect on, you know, how do I ensure that they are a culture fit and there's a lot of tools kind of coming, they're still in their infancy, but I, I see that kind of evolving. The other part is basically part of the messaging itself, right? Kind of by saying specifically certain things to certain, you know, on your Kelly website, clearly saying that this is who you are, kind of stands for that culture and ensuring that those messages are resonating at the right levels is another way we have kind of typically, you know, made that culture kind of explicit without kind of talking specifically about it, which kind of means self selection in many cases, because they're looking at those descriptions and they're looking at that experience and saying, hey, this is not for me. Kind of building that into your conversation uh, helps helps make that cultural selection through the through the process of engagement with the candidate itself. So we have we've used a combination of assessment tools and and basically those messaging and conversations to manage that cultural aspect for our clients. Um, I would also just add that um, for us, again, when we think about this from a uh, technology standpoint, a lot of the use cases that we're trying to solve today, again, are the more sort of called administrative um, or cumbersome tasks that recruiters engage in. Um, you know, from my perspective, culture of an organization is one of the most important things that should matter to you as a job seeker. And if anything, we're trying to amplify that part of the discussion. Certainly for me, if I was joining a new company, um, regardless of even hypothetically, um, if AI could help solve this for me, I would still want to sit down and, and speak to someone. I mean, this is someone I'm going to spend seven hours a day with, uh, five days a week. Um, I would want to understand the culture that I'm joining. Um, but again, if, if we can take some of those more administrative tasks um, and, and the more high value work, which I think is sitting down and talking about culture and, and, and fit, um, then that's really the work of uh, recruiters and job seekers that we want to be amplifying. So actually, that's, 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 I love that you, you touched on that because um, obviously this, these capabilities are, are allowing recruiters to have more time. We're essentially giving people back more time. So are your customers who have implemented these technologies being able to go on and do, have better cultural conversations and have more you know, one-on-one -on -one time with candidates? Have, have any of you experienced that? Yeah, I think for us, the getting the culture message across is about being honest and transparent. And sometimes technology adds a layer of friction to getting to that point. Um, so for our customers, removing the friction of finding jobs that might be have the job title in its own lingo, um, you know, like some of those job titles up there I recognize because they're our clients. Uh, if you can take that out of the way of the process of getting to know the company, you'll be you'll get to that conversation faster. You'll get to know that process faster. And what we've learned is that even the way the interviews are held, uh, the way that you get responded to by a recruiter, you know, some of our companies um, are very empathetic to the whole process and they're really holding your hand through it. And that's great. That's their culture. Doesn't mean it's better culture than any other companies. While others, they'll make you sit in the black hole. You get this amazing call, and then you're in the interview process, and you could be hired very quickly thereafter. Um, so I think the more we can take friction out of the way and let the job seekers experience the actual culture of the company, uh, the better that process is for both sides. Absolutely, and and not not just the culture, but also that face to face interaction, right? So when you meet someone, the, the presence in the room, things like that, which is what depending upon certain jobs, you cannot put that into a resume and have AI match through that and all that stuff. That's basically an experience. You kind of meet Joe and I say, Joe, hello. And I met him this morning. I'm like, I like this guy, right? Uh, so that conversation aspect, which basically is I think very different from putting your words in the resume is I think what hiring managers and recruiters will focus more on than necessarily do they have this J2EE skill here and yeah. and all that stuff I think can, can get automated at some point uh, so that you're not searching on all conditions and if conditions and all that as recruiters, but having human conversations. Yeah. yeah, I think the goal is to take away the low value task work, right? Let's focus on recruiters uh, doing what they do best and that's selling the organization and the culture and uh, the opportunity to um, you know, have automation uh, deliver the messages that uh, correlate to the culture uh, and it's just happening behind the scenes is cool. So. Excellent. I believe we have time for one more question. Good morning. My name is Kimberly Jones. My organization is Kelton Legend. I'm also an instructor at UC Irvine. I teach a course on technology applications and talent management. Grew up in recruiting. And one of the things that's been interesting for me is I feel like you hear from, can from companies that uh, volume interest is a burden more than it is a blessing. And where AI is used to find that one candidate, 
But what I'd like to understand is potentially in your product roadmap and maybe even for Google, if I open up a rec and a minute later I have 300 candidates, I want to find those right three or four who really are my ultimate candidates late. But how can you use AI to immediately evaluate the remainder of that active candidate pool to see how many other silver medalists are there? Or are there candidates that can be reallocated to current opportunities or future opportunities to really, really build a pipeline and help impact uh, return on investment and then ultimately um, time to fill? That's a great question. <laughs> There's a lot there. I think it's a strategy on how you are building your talent pools, right? So we've seen a significant shift into not recruiting for a requisition, but maybe a, a, a segment of people that you are evaluating as a whole and then being able to shift them as an example, um, you know, kind of I have a community that I'm pooling for nurses as an example, right? Well, there's all types of, of nurses, right? There's ER, there's um, RNs, et cetera. So the idea of kind of qualifying in and communicating to that, to that nursing segment, but then to let AI, you know, build out the profile of a person against a job profile, which at the end of the day should help you pipeline to multiple jobs depending on you know, the job requirements, location, years of experience, right? So if you think about that stack, you know, AI is really meant, but it's kind of a shift in, in how you're setting up your recruiting efforts. You shouldn't be necessarily in these environments focused on requisition recruiting, but more of a pool that have like attributes. Yeah, and from a technology perspective, that's exactly uh, what Jane's point is exactly, I think, what actually all of our companies are probably working with Google on kind of that aspect of profiles and how to kind of build the profiles and not just look at this as this candidate applied to this particular job, but when a recruiter goes to another job and, hey, this candidate applied for this particular job but was a silver medalist or maybe not even considered for that particular job, they might be ready for another job and having that surface up in your talent pool uh, and that's exactly, I think all of us probably have some version of that in our, our, our tools right now. And I think it's evolving and I see that as a powerful differentiator for recruiters in the long run. Yeah, I know we've touched on, um, from a candidate perspective, um, job discovery and being able to surface uh, really relevant results to a job seeker. Um, but I think the same is true about recruiters. So for instance, one of the um, <clears throat> features that we employ today within our platform is the ability to semantically force rank candidates. Um, and if you look, I mean, you know, average corporate recruiter probably spends five to 10 seconds looking at a resume. Um, if all you're doing is looking through those in chronological order, um, then you're, you're wasting a lot of time in, in the day, right? Um, if we can even get you sort of halfway there uh, by saying, you know, here's the, the, the 10 or 20, you know, you should really be looking at, um, well, then not only can you sort of um, cut out sort of uh, candidates that just did not make any sense for the role, but on the candidates that do make sense, again, you can spend more time on those um, high value added uh, discussions. Yeah, I think Jane started off really strongly. I think the concept of people being associated or attached to a job requisition is going to go away as AI gets better. I think you have an opening or availability in the company and you have a talent pool. And then ideally that talent pool is constantly growing and evolving and AI will help you pick folks from that talent pool and then suggest them for openings in your company. So rather than just attaching themselves to that rec, I think we can get to a spot where it's these pools and you're using intelligence to then find the right people there. But that opens up a whole nother area, which I think is equally as important, where you're constantly validating these processes. Uh, we're seeing a lot of our, our companies and clients have IO psychologists in-house constantly looking at how the selection is made. Um, because we have to be honest and say, we, there is going to be bias in the system. We are going to hire you know, more men than we should, but was the AI making the decision on their actual skills or was it making the decision because it was actually biased against women and the schools they go to? So it's not just a single level or layer problem. You've gotta be able to dig in deep. And as we make Rex more fluid and rely more on talent pools and algorithms, we have to constantly be validating the process that goes along with it. So I think that it can accelerate things, but we also take a step back and slow down and look at how we're doing this and understanding where the biases are and how to remove them intelligently, not be paralyzed by them. Super, well, thank you very much to our panelists here. And um, that closes off uh, the morning session. Awesome, thank you. So if we're... If
if, before you run away, we have a little gift. Um, thanks to Lynette and Doug Berg over at Zap Info. Um, we have a book, Humanity Works. Probably many people in the audience picked one up as they walked in. This is from our second presenter, um, Alexander Levitt. She's going to, I'm sure, talk a little bit about it. And Tark, when you're not getting away so easy. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Um, I finished reading this in the plane here. Um, and for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to read it yet, it's it's uh, it's great. It's, it talks a lot about technology where and it paints a mostly optimistic uh, view of where we're going to be very consistent, I think, with a lot of the things you guys said. Um, it also talks a lot about millennials, Gen Z, um, and it throws in my favorite part, a bunch of little Gen Xer references to like 80s music. It was fantastic. So for the people in the room, we're going to have about a 15 minute break if we can all be back at uh, 10 after the hour um, for the people at home. Um, this is a great time to let out your dog or to take your CEO for a walk. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah. We're going to get started in a minute. If, uh, if people can grab their seats, that last cup of coffee. Mic stand. So if you want to a few years ago, guide them that way. So he was like, "Today's not going to be." Since last year, so we're kind of reestablishing contact with them. And he said, "Today is the day. Hey, today they are a fun ride for us. So if you show up now, I'm excited." Testing. stream a little bit late. Um, I'm Stephen Rothberg with College Recruiter. We're the host. Um, thank you very much again to, uh, sorry, we're the organizer. Thank you very much to our host, Google. Um, College Recruiter is a job search site used by about two and a half million students and recent grads a year to find part-time seasonal internship and entry-level jobs. Um, our customers are primarily Fortune 1000 companies and federal government agencies that advertise their job openings with us. Um, to the feature presentation today is um, my friend and at times uh, partner in crime. Yes. Um, Alexander Levitch, who's the uh, author of Humanity Works, and I can see on the slide deck there's mm -hmm. one here. Um, I just finished reading this book on the flight out here um, and really enjoyed it. A lot of these, um, a lot of the information early on is directly related to 
what we're talking about here today. Um, and then there are some fun anecdotes on Gen Z and Gen X movies and music and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It was the music ones that I kind of like. It's like, oh, wow, she has the same taste in music as I do. I felt bad for her. Um, so um, Alex is going to talk about merging technologies and people in the workforce. Oh, OK, good. Um, she's um, um, one of the sort of the first concrete ways or substantial ways that she and I had the opportunity to work together is that she's the chair of the uh, Career Advisory Board, which is a think tank um, sponsored by DeVry University. Um, and I've been on that as a uh, board member for two years Cheers. now, two years. Yep. Um, I'm on double secret probation, so you know we'll see how long <laughs> that, that continues. But uh, I don't think I've been awful um, on it. And um, so, and then Alex can introduce her panelists mm -hmm. and um, take it away. Okay, thanks, Steve. All right, thank you, Alex. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Google. Welcome to College Recruiter Bootcamp. My name is Alexandra Levitt. I'm a business and workplace author, speaker, and consultant. I also consider myself to be a true 21st century employee. In the last three months, I have bid on two dozen new projects. I've worked for about six clients, and I've done two conference calls in the middle of the night. In learning how to become a 21st century employee, I have mastered skills like diplomacy, interpersonal problem solving. I have learned skills like how to be marketable, how to always put myself forward. Now, my interest in the future actually started way back in 1988. I lived down the street from the headquarters of the World Future Society. And my dad and I were really into sci-fi. So my dad was partial to Star Trek. I was into Ender's Game. Ooh, yeah. And so we wanted a tour of the World Future Society. So we went down the street and we got a tour. And I'll never forget this one technology. It was called interactive television. And the idea was, it would be a device, you would push a button, and boop, instantaneously you would get to hear the Cosby Show episode you'd missed last Thursday. You'd push another beep, and instantaneously you would get to hear the new Madonna single that you had missed on the radio that day. Now, if you all think about it, what technology was that the precursor for that you all have within a foot of your person? Someone said it back there. The smartphone. And that's when I became hooked on the future. Now, my interest in the future converged with my interest in HR when I wrote a book called They Don't Teach Corporate in College in 2004. And I started getting asked to talk to audiences like you all about young professionals specifically. And that's when people started asking me, what do you think young professionals are gonna need to be prepared for in terms of the future of work? And so that brings us here today. That's mostly the subject of the new book, Humanity Works, which you all will get a copy of. What we're going to be doing over the next hour or so, I'm gonna spend about the next 15 minutes, it's gonna be a speed round of some of the future work trends that you all need to be keeping in mind as people in the recruiting field. So we're gonna talk about changing demographics, tech advances, evolving structures, human skills, and customization. And if you think about this, I like to call it the space shuttle view because we are starting with demographics. Who is going to be available to work and where? That's looking down at the earth from a space shuttle perspective. Then we move to the company level. Then we move to the individual level. So that's roughly the structure of the remarks for the next 15 minutes. And you will have to bear with me that I'm gonna go through these very quickly because normally I would spend a couple of hours talking through these five. But because I wanna to get to our wonderful panel and I want to, you to hear all of the insights they have about AI and recruiting, we are going to go through these relatively quickly. So starting with changing demographics, important thing to realize is that who is going to be available to work is going to be changing. And specifically, China and India as developing nations will become the leading exporters of qualified talent. The population in developed nations such as the US and the UK is actually going to decrease. So we're going to see more workers, at least in the professional world, coming in from other places which means that we will be sourcing talent from places that we didn't source it before, where we might have been able to get US workers before, we are going to be going to countries like China and India. The baby boomers are going to be in retirement, but what that means is a little bit different than prior generations who went into retirement. Prior generations, when they retired, they did things like move down to Florida and play Mahjong <laughs> and golf. The boomers are showing us that they don't want to do this, that they want to contribute in meaningful ways. 
maybe not working 60 to 80 hours a week, but they want to keep working for their companies. And this has impact for us as recruiting and HR professionals because we have to find a way to keep them in our organizations. I still get calls to this day asking me what to do about my millennial entry level employees. Millennials aren't entry level anymore. Right. You all know that. The oldest millennials are turning 39 years old this coming year. They're the leaders. In fact, a recent study I did with Deloitte determined that as of two years ago, all global working millennial professionals, half of them considered themselves to be leaders, meaning they had decision-making authority and at least two direct reports. They are entering leadership positions an average of 10 years earlier than prior generations. The reason for that is that the generation in between the boomers and the millennials is very small. Who knows what that generation is? X. X. Great generation. I'm a part of it myself, but we're little. Not enough of us to take over for the boomers. And so you see the millennials rising. Now, the entry level people we do have to keep in mind are who? Z. Z. <laughs> generation Z. The oldest ones graduated from college this past May. That they are the oldest. They are different from the millennials in that they are more independent. They are used to getting answers via Google or Siri. They hack their education, meaning whatever they need to know, they're going to go and find it out. They're not going to wait for a teacher or a parent to tell them or an employer. They're into tours of duty, meaning that they're going to go into a company, they're going to achieve a goal, and then they may or may not move on. Now, what I hope with Gen Z is that we are proactive about their development. With the millennials, we were constantly being reactive. We didn't expect them to have much of an impact. And to this day, we are reaping the consequences of that. So we have an opportunity now as recruiters to really find out what this generation wants and needs and to deliver it in real time. Labor shortages and geographic skills mismatches. We see countries like Russia having a shortage of 20 million working aged people by 2030. And a country like Russia might need people who are in a specific, specific skill area that let's say India or China has a lot of. But where we're running into problems, and some of you I'm sure have clients like this, is when companies say, no, I want people in my immediate geographic area to have those skills. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what you can do in a moment. And then finally, we have the rise of transformational leadership. And this is driven by the millennials who are not into the command and control hierarchical style. Transformational leaders are receptive to different points of view that might come from the bottom of an organization. They're into cognitive diversity, meaning that they wanna hear perspectives from all around, from all different types of people. And they're comfortable with uncertainty because they recognize that one of the principal leadership skills is agility in the 21st century. So I bring that up in demographics just because I feel like the millennials are driving this. They are becoming the leaders and they enjoy this style. Next, let's talk about tech advances. So of course, that's the main subject of our conference today, specifically AI. I hear a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of doomsday scenarios around automation taking over all of our jobs and humans are not going to be employed. And when we look at the research, we actually see that the majority of jobs, about 60%, this is the latest research from McKinsey, 60% of occupations will be affected by automation in the next 10 years. But will all of those jobs go away? No, only about 30% of the tasks within those 60% of occupations will be automated, which basically means that automation will replace parts of jobs rather than complete jobs. And in many cases, automation will add jobs. And let me give you an example of that. Wherever there is a machine inserted into a process, there needs to be a human being behind it to build it, to design it, to figure out how to manage it, to fix it when it's broken, and to redeploy it. I'm familiar with an organization in Chicago, it's a pharmaceutical company, that is introducing a chatbot. You would think the chatbot was going to help with the onboarding function and eliminate some human jobs. Instead, what's happened is no fewer than 15 HR professionals are involved with the rollout of this chatbot. Those people were all doing different things before. Now part of their responsibility is managing this chat bot. So those jobs have been created. 
Big data started in the recruiting and HR field where we were starting to use things like predictive analytics to determine where our most successful hires would come from, what schools we should target, what skills should we look at. Now, the good news for you all is you're ahead of the curve on this. Sometimes people laugh at me when I say HR is ahead of the curve, but that is being filtered to other parts of the organization. And I mentioned this to you because you are going to be asked for your expertise in using big data and predictive analytics to make the workforce as a whole more productive. And you all are ahead, so you need to be prepared for that. Human machine hybrid teams, it sounds scary to a lot of people. What do I mean by that? Do I mean a robot is going to be sitting next to you in the cube? Really what I mean is that we're gonna have parts of tasks taken over by automation, by robots. And that is starting in the form of the chatbot. A chatbot is a piece of code, it's an algorithm that accomplishes a basic task. And in some cases, a chatbot can even be in the form of a device. So my favorite example right now is Alexa for business. How many of you have Alexa in your home? So Alexa is coming to a workforce near you, and Alexa is going to serve as our intelligent personal assistant that might do everything from setting up a meeting to reminding people to come, to pulling down the screen and loading the PowerPoint, and then cleaning up the room when you're finished. That's where we're gonna see the human machine hybrid teams really start. Now, as machines get more sophisticated, we're gonna see them doing more complex tasks. But for right now, we are really seeing it in the form of chatbots. And then finally, the maturation of deep learning and effective computing. How many of you have Gmail? Almost everyone. Have you noticed in the last three months that Gmail has become smarter? It becomes smarter, I feel like, every day as it learns more about how you answer and respond to emails, and it makes suggestions. It's learning from the experience. Now, of course, there's a limit to what machines can learn for a time. I think right now we can expect to see that it's pretty basic. But at some point, they are going to start to be able to mimic and replicate human emotion. And this is known as effective computing. We already see it in some departments of customer service where a customer service bot will be able to read body language, will be able to assess how a person is feeling given what they say and if they're in person, what they look like. My favorite future implementation of this that I've heard about is the salary robot, where instead of going to your boss and presenting a case on why you should get a raise, you're going to have to present that case in front of a robot that has effective computing ability. And that robot will assess, how confident are you that you should get this raise? It'll analyze the business case for sure. Do you deserve it or not? But it'll also be able to give feedback on how likely are you to walk if you don't get that money? That's effective computing. And we are gonna see huge strides made in this in the next 10 to 15 years. So be on the lookout or the salary robots. <laughs> Evolving structures, the way we work, the places we work is going to change. So most of you are familiar with the idea, being adjacent to the HR field, that flex work and contract work are becoming pervasive. This makes sense because companies are not wanting to pay significant overhead and benefits and money to house everyone and to give them remarkable items of food like we see here at Google if they don't have to. And also we look at the sourcing issues and the fact that we have these geographic skills mismatches where we can't get full-time employees to be available. So we have to have these virtual teams that are sourced from other places. So we have flex work, meaning you don't necessarily have to be anywhere from nine to five, that you can either work maybe three days a week and two from home, or you can work a split schedule. I've even heard of things like maternity leave partners where two employees wanna get pregnant, one goes off for three months, comes back, the other one goes off. Flex work can take all sorts of forms. And the most important thing to recognize about flex work, I always tell HR folks is you gotta have a policy and you've gotta limit the choices that people have. Otherwise you're setting yourself up for disaster. And then contract work of course refers to people who don't work full-time for any one organization. This too can be problematic because some organizations don't know what makes a contract worker and what doesn't. And in fact, the IRS has very strict stipulations and globally other countries do as well. 
So you have to know about those. You also have to know how to systematize your contract workforce. What I see happening in a lot of situations is I see one manager bringing in a contract worker through a process. Somebody else in the organization is doing it completely differently. And I haven't seen it happen yet, but I think it's coming. The contract workers are going to cause organizations great pain because someone is going to end up <coughs> saying something to a customer or a stakeholder that they were not allowed to say because they were not onboarded because contract workers don't get onboarded. So when you guys look at this from a recruiting perspective, you have to be prepared for some systemization of how we bring in these contract workers. Swarm teams, I did not make up the term swarm. It came from Gartner, which is an industry analyst term, but swarming <laughs> refers to a team that is assembled very quickly for the express purpose of solving a particular business problem. And then when that problem is solved, the team is disbanded. So this impacts you all as recruiting professionals because you may not be recruiting for full-time positions. You may be recruiting for business problems specifically. And the swarm teams may either continue to work at the organization or they might go on and do something else immediately afterward. These teams are gonna be powered by some new technologies. Augmented reality, that's what AR is. Augmented reality refers to you look at your landscape, you look at your real world environment, but you have extra information that's interlaid on top of that. So for example, you're walking down the street with your Google glasses. You might have your Google glasses telling you, hey, I know you like to drink Starbucks at 730. There's a Starbucks right on the corner and it'll pop up in your glasses and it'll tell you exactly where you need to go. That's augmented reality. Virtual reality is something that has great implications for recruiting where you take someone to a completely new environment. So when you're recruiting someone, you could take them into the Googleplex and show them, here's what it's actually like to work here. We will give you a tour. So virtual reality is different in that it's a completely new environment. It's not your existing environment with extra information like augmented reality. And then finally, telepresence. Telepresence just refers to you beaming yourself into an office environment when you might not actually be there. So right now it's very rudimentary. It's just a face on an iPad that's attached to a little rolling robot. And it's great in the sense that you can kind of walk around the office and participate. But there are some challenges with this, as you can imagine. Like if someone picks up your telepresence robot in an effort to get it out of the way in a hallway, are they invading your personal space? <laughs> These are some of the issues that telepresence will bring up. And then finally here, the rise of the holacracy. So holacracy refers to an organization without titles where everybody fights for resources, you make your best case on a given day, and you pr receive permission to go forward. Now, holacracy is a structure that has its challenges because who signs the checks at the end of the day? Sometimes there is mass chaos because no one is sure what the organizational priorities, mission, vision, and values are. So I bring this up because holacracy is one of those areas I think we all have to be very diligent in saying, okay, let's meet in the middle somewhere on this. We don't have to be quite as hierarchical with all these extra layers, but we do have to have some order because there's a reason the corporate world was created the way it was with managers. And it's so there isn't total chaos. So this is something I think we need to be very prudent about recommending and helping to implement. Human skills. I bring up human skills because this is what we are going to be looking for as recruiters. These are the skills we really need to be emphasizing among our workforce because they are the things that are going to set us apart from smart machines. Creativity and craftsmanship are number one. We see machines even today starting to do creative endeavors. The problem is a lot of times they miss the mark and they are incapable of telling if something is any good or not. And the rise of craftsmanship is something that has, we've seen happen for a couple hundred years. Even as mass production became possible, there's still something about having a human being touch what you've done and touch what you are gonna have in your home. And so I think we're gonna see the rise of sites like Etsy where people are making things. And so those people are going to be continually employed in your organizations. Even if a machine can do the work, doesn't necessarily mean people are gonna want it to do the work. And that's the same thing with interpersonal sensitivity and empathy. My favorite example here is Japan. Japan tried to automate nursing. They developed a six foot tall white bear called Robear. 
And the idea was that Robert would take over nursing because they had a nursing shortage. At the end of the day, all Robert was really able to do was move patients in and out of bed and serve them food. When you think about the complex tasks associated with nursing, it's things like walking into a room that's an emergency situation and immediately knowing what specialists you should bring in based on your years of working with those people. It's looking into a patient's eyes and being able to detail the degree of pain that that person is in simply by looking at them. It's being able to sit down and have a conversation with a relative over a difficult diagnosis that a doctor has just given. Those are very complex interpersonal skills that robots can simply not take over. And I think until machines develop consciousness and true empathy, which will probably happen, but not for about, I would guess it's probably at least 30 years away, not something we need to worry about immediately. This is what makes humans human. Learning agility, very important. The days of having a degree and being able to rest on that for five, 10, 15 years, over. Everyone needs to be responsible for continuously skilling, reskilling, and upskilling. I'm a poster child for this. I'm taking a data analytics course right now because I recommend it all the time, and I don't really know exactly how it works, but I'm taking charge of my own career path, and every single person we recruit needs to be showing that they have this learning agility. And we're gonna talk in the panel in a minute about bias, but this is my cautionary tale. Wherever there is bias, and we have algorithms, we're going to see human bias infiltrate those algorithms. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. This is an area where it's not a good quality that humans have, but it's one that's very natural. We just develop sometimes biases based on either prior experience or it's kind of built in due to society. And this is something that no matter how sophisticated we get, no matter how sophisticated machines get, we're going to have to contend with. The last section I wanna talk about here before we get to our amazing panel, I don't wanna to waste too much time before introducing them, laterals and sideways moves, probably the principal area of career customization, which is something that is going to be very important to recruiting folks who are trying to bring people in and show them that they can grow their careers in a particular organization. We are seeing now that the days of moving from point A to point Z or point B and then from point A to point C no longer applies. You don't necessarily look at your boss and say, okay, this is exactly where my career is going to go because my boss did it this way. Now people have more choices than ever. You can do anything you want. And in fact, those of us who advise on careers advise on developing as wide a bench as possible, developing as many cross-functional areas of expertise as you can. We've also referred to these as transferable skills, things like marketing, finance, Things that no matter how or where you go in an organization, you might need. And so by facilitating lateral and sideways moves, we encourage people to move throughout an organization and get those skills. So similarly, we see two areas up, up here. Rotations are an area where a lot of companies are spending a lot of money rotating people through different departments and they might be on a three month or a six month course. Now, my advice on this is that this doesn't have to be as expensive as current companies are making it. Rotations could be as simple as some group has an extra project that they might be working on and they are slammed to the wall and they don't have the bandwidth to finish it, but another department in the organization might be able to spare someone who wants to come over and work in that area and learn that expertise. So it can be as simple as having an internal job board where people share responsibilities throughout the organization. Now, of course, as you can ima imagine, who's the barrier to this kind of thing? HR is not the barrier, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. The manager is the barrier. We have to be educating our managers that people are not going to want to come in because they're hearing from people like me that they need to develop cross-functional expertise if we don't give them those opportunities. So managers have to stop being so territorial over their people and recognize it's in their best interest to have people who are as wide as possible because they don't know how their departments are going to need to evolve and change. That's a message that's important. Tours of duty, I mentioned those with Gen Z. That's coming into an organization not necessarily prepared to work for the rest of your life or even a few years. You're coming in to solve an express business problem and when it's done, when you've achieved a goal, when you finish the project, when you can show results, you then renegotiate your contract 
with the organization. This is pretty rare, I would say, right now, but it's something that I think Gen Z is going to start pushing. School and organizational partnerships is my favorite solution to the geographic skills mismatches issue. I see a lot of companies in rural areas, for example, that want to recruit people from that area, and those people simply don't have the skills. So what we can do about that is partner in our local communities and say, I'm going to source people from the community who have the ability to learn this skill set. I'm going to bring them in. They're going to become trained in exactly the job that they need to do. This is also something that can combat the problem we have with mass unemployment of certain sectors of people. Why can't those people partner with schools to learn very specific skills or partner with the company directly? So my favorite example, Steve mentioned DeVry. DeVry partnered with the FBI because the FBI was having a cybersecurity shortage. They did not have enough people trained in this to fill the pipeline of the FBI. So they partnered with DeVry's College of Information Sciences to develop a curriculum that would directly move people from DeVry into those FBI positions. So that's an example of where the curriculum was developed specifically to fill the skills gap in a particular organization. And this has a lot of problems. And then I close my discussion of customization with an area that some people think is a little bit big brother. And that's productivity wearables. In the next 10 years, not only your career will be customized, but every moment of every day has the ability to be customized because you will wear a device that will be able to tell how often you're interacting with other people, whether you are working fast enough at a particular task. What if your partner is working on a particular task faster and putting out more than you are? Does that mean that your boss should then tell you, I don't think you should do this anymore because so-and-so is doing it faster? This is going to bring up all sorts of privacy-related issues, all sorts of issues around meaningful work. Just because you're not as fast at something, maybe you enjoy it. Maybe you want to do it anyway. And businesses are going to be on top of this due to the impact on the bottom line. They're going to want their employees to be as fast and as efficient as possible. So I bring it up to you because I think you all need to be aware of it. Because right now, as we stand here, or as I stand here and you sit, 10% of organizations are using some form of productivity wearable, particularly with their tech staff. How fast can you code? How much can you put out? What software programs can you learn to use? How productive are you? So career customization, our final trend today. So without further ado, I'm going to sit down. I should probably bring this with me, actually. And I'm going to introduce our esteemed panel. This is our spotlight panel on AI and recruiting. So now we're going to deep, dive down deep into an issue that is near and dear to you all. We've already started talking about it this morning, so hopefully you were warmed up. Now we're going to get a little bit more specific on some of the issues that might have piqued your interest. And without uh, further ado, I will introduce our panel. We start with <clears throat> Jared Bazal. He currently serves as the manager of talent acquisition at CDW, me here in Chicago, a leading Fortune 200 multi-brand technology solutions provider for business, government, education, and healthcare organizations in the U.S., Canada, and the UK. In this role, Jared is responsible for overseeing all university recruiting and company internship programs, and is also responsible for the management and development of an international team, including acquisitions, onboarding, and training efforts. Welcome, Jared. Thanks. Next, we have Doug Berg. Doug is a multi-startup entrepreneur and investor in the talent technology industry. He founded techies.com, which was the number one career site for tech professionals, and jobs to web which is the first recruitment marketing platform acquired by SAP in 2011 for over 110 million. It's, and he is now the chief zapper for Zap Info. <laughs> which, is, yay, which is an information automation platform used by over 5,000 talent acquisition pros to easily find, extract, enrich, and share people data across the web. Welcome, Doug. Wahab Oulabi is a passionate builder of communities and networks and the founder of URX and the producer of the URX conference. He's on the recruiting team at Rubrik, where he leads university recruiting. Rubrik has become an employer of choice among top engineering students and ranked in the top 10 of LinkedIn's 
career launching startups. Wahab has also worked at both Stanford University and Carnegie Mellon University, helping technology companies recruit top talent and helping students launch technical careers. Welcome, Wahab. And then I love to be on panels with other women, so it's my absolute joy to recognize Jennifer Sethry. She is the CEO and founder of Intree, a tech-driven matchmaking service for job applicants and employers. She's an entrepreneur, consultant, thought leader, and senior executive in the tech product, marketing, and operations space. As president, CEO, and VP of multiple technology and consumer product companies, Jennifer has injected creativity, integrity, and innovation into operations, product creation, supply chain, branding, and marketing for startups, as well as public companies around the world. Welcome, Jennifer. So you can see we have a brain trust here of folks who really know about AI and recruiting. And over the next several minutes, what we're going to be doing is starting us off with some questions that we thought you might want to have answered. And so each of us is gonna lead off with some answers, and then we are going to have plenty of time for you all to ask your questions of our panelists as well, because rare is it that we get such an incredible group of people together in one place, and we can thank Steve and College Recruiter for that. And uh, let us, let's go ahead and move on to our very first question, which Jennifer is going to address first. How will AI transform the recruiting function in the next je decade? Jennifer, would you just like to kick us off? <laughs> so thanks for the introduction. I feel just a little bit of pressure after that. Um, so I think, you know, the you all had the first question on the first panel did a, a really great job. I think for for me and I think people on the panel, the, the AI can transform in so many different ways. One is really about bias and helping to eliminate the bias and how you put together job descriptions, how you build resumes, how you eliminate. Um, have you guys seen the word ninja in job descriptions lately? Right? So ninja, rock star, et cetera. You see them in a lot of job descriptions. And so one of the ways that AI can do that is, is well, algorithms and machine learning too. It's a step process, but can really, um, build synonym tables and text spinners and all of those things to find other words that mean the same thing to different people. So when um, you, there was the one slide up there that said if you are a security guard and there are all these different titles, that's one way that AI can really help bridge the gap between gender and help eliminate bias. I think that AI can also, in my current company and other companies that are here in this room can really facilitate the matching between an employee and a candidate, not just based on skills, but based on their, their EQ, a personality assessment, a culture assessment. Um, what does their LinkedIn look like? What are the hidden variables that you can find between an employer and a candidate? And AI can really use those things to sort of bubble them, bubble them up to uh, help the hiring manager find the right person for the right role. I also think within HR, HR is really siloed. You have HR technology, you have traditional HR, and then you have the talent acquisition group in HR. And oftentimes those people don't talk to each other. They are, are siloed from each other. Sometimes they don't share the same technology. Sometimes they have different enterprise software systems. And I actually think AR can help HR people really become sort of a revenue generator. If HR people and, and teams can bring in the right person for the right job and there isn't as much attrition, then you spend less money on recruiting and you have the right person in the right job for a longer period of time. I guess those are just some of the things that come to mind. It's great. It's a great overview. Anyone have something they'd like to add? Yeah, I, you know, I think um, where exactly AI is going to help out throughout the recruiting life cycle is still um, to be determined. I think from our experience at CW, though, it's really been the front end um, after application. Uh, you know, that's where we've seen the biggest, uh, I will say, ROI for our recruiting teams, right? How do we get through and identify who are the best candidates? There are a ton of tools out there that touch the entire life cycle. Um, and, you know, I think as the industry continues to develop, um, the technology across the entire stack will continue to develop as well. Mm -hmm. While you have the mic, or do you want to add something, Doug? Yes. Yeah. 
Wahab, go ahead. So I guess I think for us at Rubric in particular, one of the ways that we've been looking at it is developing talent communities. And so you have so many people that come into your pipeline and um, for the most part, you're not gonna have enough jobs for everyone um, at that particular time. But you know, something that we're exploring is, hey, can we utilize AI to maintain touch points at given periods across this individual's uh, career pathway that we can kind of time against either their graduation year of university um, or their amount of time in a particular job that they've let us know that they're they're in. So for example, somebody's been at, we know sort of like the data around how often people change, change jobs in the Bay Area. And so if somebody has been in a job for 18 months, you know, that might be a time that we want to go ahead and ping that person if we have um, a particular role that, that they're a good fit for. Um, individually, it's hard to do, but with AI at scale, you can literally go through our open recs and match it against this community that we're working to build. So that's something that, you know, hasn't, we haven't quite figured it out, but we're trying to set that up. That's terrific. One thing I'll add, um, you know, I think that is unique. So we're a, we're a member of a talent community where um, if you get rejected from a role at CUW, we actually invite you to join the shared talent community of member companies <laughs> and you'll take an assessment, you'll create a profile in that system, and then it will invite you to apply um, to other member companies, which I think, you know, how do we continue to utilize AI to match people to jobs they may be a better fit for? Um, you know, the, the amount of people um, that apply to our open requisitions uh, it is significant, right? So getting smarter around that. Um, I also will say, I think there's an opportunity on the front end from a sourcing aspect of, uh, you know, we've actually joined with a couple other companies to invite people to play some games. And then based upon how they actually score in those games, they will get matched to a member company. That, um, right. yeah. and so there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, that, I, that's, I mean, that's phenomenal. And I think even using a chat bot or using some of that technology to continue to engage these people when they have been rejected, but you still want them to be part of the community. Okay, so can we go on to the next question? Is that okay? Jared, is this? Sure. One that you're going to take. What is the most challenging recruiting problem you are solving or hoping to solve with AI? And what solutions are available that you can recommend to our audience? Yeah, so I think um, for us, the most pressing issue is just how do we get through all of the candidates, right? And how do we identify who is the best candidate? Um, we've worked a lot with our internal data science team to look at things like uh, long-term success in the role, look at things like goal attainment, uh, performance metrics, and how do we take and use that data that we've gathered, that big data, um, and, and bring it into our recruiting process to drive change. And I think that's through um, really the use of AI. Um, but we know, for instance, for some of our hard-to-fill roles, um, we hire one in 30, one in 50 people. Um, so the amount of time that it takes to screen that many people to get through the qualification, to get through everything that we need to is significant, right? Um, so there's opportunity there to use AI to continue to refine that, but it's not for us. It's not a, and I think that's one thing that people are like, oh no, you're gonna actually replace recruiters. We'll never replace recruiters. Um, and you know, long-term um, we see that opportunity to reinvest it yeah. into other areas. Yeah, that's great. Anyone have something else they'd like to add on challenges? I think the sheer amount of data is, is one of those challenges that AI is hopefully going to solve or at least mitigate for many departments. I think one of the things I see in a lot of people in talent acquisition are trying to come up with what I'll call the perfect stack. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if I just buy Jibe or if I just buy Jibe plus, you know, whatever ATS plus whatever CRM plus whatever, uh, and they all work harmoniously together. I think there's just a lot of talent that gets lost in the cracks across all of these different platforms. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think, you know, in recruiting, they say that you recruit for skills and titles, but you hire for culture and personality. And there's still to me an amazing lack of that kind of content or data or searchability within the job contents and companies still haven't done what I call this micro branding work where I might have a company culture that's at the top, but every single hiring manager runs his teams in a different way, right? So imagine right. going to a career site and instead of searching for a design job, search for a, a design job that is working for a type A manager that's short-term burst projects where I can work on a very small team. 
You can't do that stuff, and yet that's exactly how people would want to search for jobs. So um, there's a lot that can be done around how you could harvest that information and that data and collate it and put it into the search mechanisms or even the matching algorithms that I think AI is going to do. But I think AI, as it shows up, it's going to show up in a thousand different point solutions. I think it's not going to show up as a single uh, platform play. But I also think it can solve cross-platform problems in really powerful ways. And I think the right AI solutions providers are going to figure out how to traverse talent from first touch through onboarding and even through their lifetime careers uh, when you work with the right platforms. Yeah, integration is one of those issues, too, that HR can be a, a leader on where other departments are, are going to need the same thing. At the, at the risk of making some people unhappy with me in the room at this comment, I do think that there is a huge amount of hiring prevention that goes on. Um, when, when, when we meet with HR teams and they're like, you know, I, I posted this job and I got 300, you know, resumes, but no one was the right fit. And then you look at the job description that they put out there and then you sort of start peeling back the onion and you're like, well, you know, what ATS system are you using? And and everybody has a different ATS system that they use, and none of them are the same. None of them really speak the same language. And when I mentioned earlier the three different silos of HR, when you have teams that don't talk to each other, and you have a job description, and it goes to legal, and legal puts their input on it, and, and then it gets posted, and, and then you have people who are applying for jobs who don't really understand how to create a resume. Maybe they go to their career center, they get a resume, they they put it out there, they don't use some of the resources that are out there, their resumes aren't gonna get parsed, right? So I think it's, there's a multi-prong approach that, that needs to start happening and changing in the marketplace that makes it easier because as, as a company and a consultant for other companies in this space, uh, it's really shocking when I hear on the news, unemployment is so low, but yet I know so many people who are working two or three jobs to sustain themselves and to just, you know, pay the rent, pay their insurance, mm -hmm. pay their car payment. And then they're qualified for the job, they send the resume out, but they never get a call back, right? And that's really where I think AI can have a meaningful difference in connecting the candidates with the jobs and the companies and, yeah. and finding the gaps, right, that some of us mm -hmm. overlook because of some of our inherent biases. Yeah, and putting forth that consistent candidate experience from the first interaction they have to either getting hired or, right. or not in the future. Look, I think a lot of the obstacles are self-imposed by us as employers, right? I mean, when mm -hmm. you think about the heart of most ATS and historical hiring systems, their bias is to disqualify candidates, right? Mm -hmm. Every one of us has an ATS system that has what in it? knockout questions, yeah. right? But what's the opposite of that? What could have been built to help us to actually identify the characteristics and attributes of talent irrespective of requisition that would help us to go, we've got somebody we're going to hire. And how do we relate to them? How do we identify them? How do we even take that in? There's almost no way to take that kind of data into a talent community or other type of a system. And so as I work with some of the AI folks, I'm like, because we all have this, let's find a needle in a haystack mentality. And I've rarely met an employer that says, I'm going to hire the whole damn haystack, right? At some point, most of the talent at, an, at whatever point I might actually want them That's in right. my employment. So how do I relate to that? How do I bring yeah. that in? And some of the better AI technologies that I've seen, for example, uh, are, are going through a conversational experience with someone when they want to work for them. And one of the best ones is, hey, you know, are you 18? And in the old days, if I was on a web form-based system and I mm -hmm. said no, it said goodbye. The new chatbots say, when do you turn 18? Right. And I'm going to follow up with you. And, they're, you know, if you can't work full-time, can you do part-time? And you're not right for the general manager job, but you're right for this other job. They're literally doing this coin sorting methodology that's actually bringing the talent into the appropriate positions like a good recruiter would if your predisposition was to try to hire everybody as opposed to disqualifying people, which is also a personality trait of a lot of different recruiters. Yes. So I think it's going to be, I think five to seven years from now, it's going to be an amazingly different world because I don't know that there's a talent shortage. I think there's an attention shortage. 
And I think there's still a lot of friction in the process, not only from search, but also from relating to talent. But what I like about what you're saying too, is that it really facilitates learning agility and the appreciation of learning agility, that if you gain a skill set down the road, that we're paying attention to that and it's something we might actually want. Okay, we are going to move to now question three. What are the most substantial obstacles you'll face or concerns you have around implementing AI solutions? Wahab, would you like to take us away with that one? For sure. Um, you know, so I thought about this one for quite a bit. I was like, <clears throat> I can just give the obvious, I think the obvious answer, uh, which for me is uh, diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, if I, if I think back to, you know, I guess my own like personal story and, mm -hmm. and how I got into tech, I, I don't think that I would have sort of been sourced out by any sort of scalable mm -hmm. AI solution. Right. So I, you know, you mentioned that I worked at Carnegie Mellon University. And um, back then I was on um, a diversity recruiting team and our motto was essentially that diversity is anything that's not well represented in whatever environment or community that you're, you are working in, right? So for Carnegie Mellon University, top engineering school in Pittsburgh, a white male from the state of Montana was an extremely diverse candidate for us because there aren't a lot of people from Montana walking around <laughs> Pittsburgh, right? Oh, we've got someone from Montana here. <laughs> how many other folks from, how many other white males from Montana in the room? You are a diverse person, sir, to me. So, but my, but, but my point is, I think in recruiting, a lot of times success to me is in, in two prongs. So from like a manager's perspective, I want to implement you know, infrastructure and tools that allow us to operate at scale efficiently and fast. But for my recruiters and people who are working with Rex, I want them to have the flexibility and the creativity to take chances is what I call it, is take chances on people, right? And so, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I wouldn't call it nervous. One of the things I would sort of encourage um, those who are implementing AI is as much as it is to enable scale, you also have to begin to think about how can I enable um, this technology and these solutions to unearth diverse talent, whatever that might mean for your organization, because it definitely varies. Um, and so I would say that's probably a, a substantial obstacle and something that, you know, we need to have as much conversation around, you know, scaling up and saving people time and making things more efficient around using the same technology to find the needle in the haystack, um, as I believe you mentioned earlier. Okay. Any of the other panelists want to add to that? Jared? So I think a lot of the obstacles that we have are either um, rules and regulations that we put in place on our teams or they're in response to um, laws or, or legislation um, that may be in place. And so one thing that comes to mind is we interview based upon date of application with a lot of our requisitions. Um, that is inherently, you know, incentivizes people that are the first to apply, right? So if we have a requisition that has 50 to 100 people that have applied within, we'll say a week, uh, we might only get through the first 10 candidates because we found somebody in those first 10 candidates who we think is great, right? Fits the bill, but perhaps um, day five, now, candidate number 40 that's applied is a better fit, right? And so I think there's a huge opportunity with AI to turn that process on its side and rethink how we go about it. Um, mm -hmm. I think the biggest obstacle a lot of people have when they implement AI solutions, although, is um, getting through legal and compliance, right? I think that's yeah. been a, a pretty significant undertaking, um, looking at the impacts, looking at how we're going to handle your personal data at CEW, how we're going to collect your biometric data, um, to you know, really kind of be on the forefront of that versus having to answer those questions, be, uh, you know, kind of on the back end. Um, and how you know, there are a lot of solutions I will tell you within AI that you might just be able to flip the switch on, right? Uh, but when you get into things that you're going to be using for um, screening tools, right, assessment-based tools, um, those are not just you know necessarily plug and play, right? You might have to do a job analysis, you might have to do a validation study on your population. Um, and, and those take time. So, anyone have anything to else to add before we move on to our final planned question? Okay, Doug, this one is for you. What can recruiting managers do today to prepare to effectively integrate AI into their operations? So let's get down to the advice. 
portion. Well, for everyone in recruiting, how many of you have had your vendors all call you within the last six months and tell you that they've got AI coming, right? <laughs> Everybody. Um, look, the, the thing that I see is there's a, a great tension with companies that want to bring AI in and the worry factor of what are the recruiters going to think because there's articles about it and everything. So my AI tip of the day is that when you start to look at AI, use AI in the sense of help your recruiters stay aware of what you're thinking about doing and involve them. So one of the greatest things that can happen is to build micro teams of research where you can let your own, even your own recruiters say, is there crappy parts of your job that we could automate using some AI? And let them go do the research, let them go out. One of the funnest experiments I've ever seen done in almost all of the global companies that I've helped work with is when they sit down and plot out all the pathways and all the redundant conversations and all of the messaging that happens uh, as you relate to your candidate populations. And all of a sudden you can start to see patterns and you can start to see best practices. I've seen groups say, oh man, I use this email to reach out to candidates and I'm getting an 80% response rate. Every other recruiter on the world wants to copy that, right? And go use that as their next LinkedIn social connecting kind of a thing. And yet I'm amazed at how siloed most recruiters are. And so as you think about using AI, at the end of the day, it's really more about automated interactions than it is about artificial intelligence when you really think about what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. You're trying to automate the interactions with candidates. You're trying to automate the interactions with profiles of people that may be applied in the past. You're trying to automate how you schedule interviews. A lot of these things are the things that kill the time that it takes recruiters and they prefer not to do it anyhow. They want to work on relationship and they want to work on results at the right. end of the day. And if there's technology that can manage and facilitate all of that at, at scales that recruiters could never think about while simultaneously synchronizing that data with your legacy system so you can do reporting to make the lawyers and everyone feel like we're actually monitoring this. And if it is making decisions, we want to know how it got to those mm -hmm. decisions for qualification or disqualification. But I think as long as you have some of those basic things in place, and by the way, how many of you have a budget right now in your budget item for next year to do AI research and development? How many? Two. So this is what's chronically happens in talent acquisition, right? We tin cup to go get a budget because I got to hire 2,000 people and the hiring managers all give me five bucks each. And then I run out of money by June and I either have to kill a vendor in order to try something. I rarely have seen a talent acquisition leader really strategically budget and have money and project time set up for this kind of thing. And yet we all know it's coming and we all know we need to do it. And by the way, it's the fun part, right, of experimentation that we get to do. Because every talent acquisition leader would love to get to this time next year and say, I implemented AI in my company and it increased our productivity by 400% and saved us $80 million. And every job was filled by December 31st, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, by the way, that's yeah. not really. But, but at the end of the day, I think that's what we're after and just a few basic things can help you to prep for that kind of stuff really, really well. There's one thing I just wanna say about the relationship of humans to what AI is working on. So not only do we as recruiters want to focus on relationships and therefore really be meaningful in terms of the, the contribution that we're making, but we also have to be careful. In, in the book, we talk about a concept called human in the loop, where we may have entire processes automated, but I think what Doug said about not being able to just blindly trust the decisions that AI is making because it's either based on a business case or it's based on the rules that you've developed. There needs to be a human, a human recruiter that's watching out for this process and recognizing when issues of bias, for example, pop up or you know, someone is being declined when they really shouldn't be because machines aren't perfect and we, they're programmed by humans who are, who are less perfect. So having that human in the loop, I, I think is really important. You, you need to be careful not to automate huge swaths of your recruiting tasks without having kind of this oversight. Did you have something, Jared, you wanted to add? Yeah. Oh, Jennifer, okay. Just by the way, some of the best AI companies that I've seen, and I've seen quite a few of them, yeah. they actually measure themselves based upon how many monthly human interventions are needed as a part of their technology. Wow, that's great. So they're, they're not only integrating the need for humans to potentially have to mm -hmm. get engaged at any time if the conversation wobbles, mm -hmm. they're smart to do that, but they actually measure themselves by how can we keep improving the AI so we meet the consumer need of the candidate for whatever they're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and do it with as low of a percentage of interaction as possible. 
I think one of the things that for me as a, as a business person, entrepreneur, in a lot of different types of businesses and companies is to really embrace the change. And innovation is something that isn't going to go away. And if innovation does start to go away, then we all need to be a little bit concerned. Uh, I think people who are recruiters and in the HR space, this is a chance to really change how your departments are being done, how you recruit people, how you hire people, how you place people. This is an opportunity, I think, to really fly and soar. And I think that there are so many tools out there that are affordable, that are scalable. So your 10 cup with your five bucks, I think five bucks of AI goes way farther than you know five bucks of trying to bring in multiple people to do jobs and review resumes. There's only so many hours in a day. And it's been my experience in the HR space that, and the recruiting space that y'all are the first people that everybody blames when the person isn't a right fit, right? right. It's like, oh, well, nice job, Sparkles. You need, to, you need to be better at your job. But the HR teams are the ones that are, you know, rift first. When there's a reduction in force and people look to lay people off, what's the first department hit? HR. Mm -hmm. Yet, what's the most important part of any company? The employees. Mm -hmm. The employees are the heartbeat of yeah. every company, of every organization. Mm -hmm. And if we can use AI to make your jobs easier and it's more cost effective, then you all do, uh, you do a better job at your job and you get the, well, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for is, but the, maybe the, the respect and the, uh, you know, the appreciation of how hard it is to find that needle in a haystack, how hard it is to bring culture from an individual to a company and the company yeah. culture to that individual. I think that this is a, one of the first time in years that you can really revolutionize the space that you're in. So, right. And it's, it's, again, it's the human value, the human skills that, that we bring to this. Okay, we have 10 minutes left for audience questions. So who would like to kick us off in the audience and ask our panelists what's on their minds after listening to about the last 40 minutes? Don't be shy. I know it's hard to be the first one to ask a question. All right. Welcome, sir. What's your name? Hi, everybody. I'm Jeremy. Hello, Jeremy. Uh, one more time. I'm Jeremy Bayon from ServiceNow. Thank you very much for the panel and the enlightened uh, discussion. Um, how do we solve or how is AI solving right now for a problem that's endemic or at least uh, it's built in to the challenge of recruiting at the university or recent graduate level, which is that even if you cast a wide net, the length of time for experience from the candidates or even um, the depth of their experience is lower in comparison with experienced hires. So um, wh where are we seeing some movement on being able to, to, to use AI to its potential in that space? So I guess I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna answer your question, but I'll tell you what <laughs> I've been doing. Uh, so obviously we, you know, we meet with a lot of vendors, um, you know, who, who sort of, you know, come in and say, hey, like, you know, here's some things we can do for you, et cetera. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, I try to recruit for and we try to recruit for is aptitude for learning. Um, so from an engineering perspective, you know, today we're using, you know, I'm going to name some random uh, coding languages, but like Scala, Go, C++, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And tomorrow, you know, my VP of engineering may come to me and say, hey, Wahab, you know, scrap all that, we're gonna be this kind of a shop now. I need this now, right? And there's no way that, you know, I could just automatically turn around and start to only recruit for that language. So what we, what we actually do is we, re we recruit for the aptitude to learn, right? So what in your experience, what in your background can show us that um, when you're giving something new, um, you're gonna be able to pick it up quickly, right? And that's what I've been telling vendors is, hey, you go figure out a way to uh, 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 figure this out for me, right? And then you become a very interesting vendor for me in the university space. Yeah, so I, I think um, 
Maybe I'll answer a little bit more directly um, just from some of our use cases of how we used AI at CDW. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity on the front end from a sourcing standpoint, uh, specifically in regards to how are we providing access for students to uh, get considered by somebody like CDW or other Fortune 500 companies. Uh, you know, so we are utilizing some systems to have students play games as a part of a, kind of a community of companies. And then based upon how you score in those games, you're getting matched with one of the member companies um, by this third party. And I think that that is a great way uh, the candidates that we are getting are already, you know, they, they're the caliber of candidates that we have seen has been much higher. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are other ways, though, that you can deploy AI internally, uh, particularly when you have early candidates that may not necessarily have the resumes or the skills listed on them. And it's using other technologies to screen, whether it's an assessment, whether it's, um, you know, a video on demand interview. Um, so actually right now we're in the process of, uh, of finalizing a contract with a vendor uh, where we'll turn on the AI overlay of a video interview. We've used the video interview provider for over 10 years um, and utilize that to help us make a refined hiring decision on candidates and uh, drive productivity throughout the recruiting process. There's a whole bunch of other pluses, I will say, um, you know, like how do we provide a realistic job preview for our candidates and additional experiences that we'll be able to accomplish via rolling this out. I love the emphasis on gamification because the students love that. Right. Yeah. So, and then something I just thought about is, you know, university, and this is an area I'm really passionate about, you guys can't tell, but university is, is an extremely high touch recruiting process. And it's very weird because you go through this fall season where it's like, go, 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 go. And then all of a sudden this person that you've hired is probably not going to make, not going to start for like six to eight months. But then in addition, the decision-making process goes from you meet somebody in August maybe, and then all of a sudden there's this deadline, and then it's very fast at the end, right? And I think you know, one, of the, one of the things that you'd want to avoid with whatever it is you do is to not eliminate too much of that high touch that happens throughout the process. Because I, the, the analogy I, I like to use is it's almost like dating, right? And so you, you have somebody that you've met who's been in this long-term relationship with maybe CDW, right? And here comes um, Rubric at the final hour saying, hey, I know you've been with CDW for five years, but I promise you, come in, into a relationship with me, start your career with Rubric, and it'll be okay, right? It's very hard to do that. And so you have to kind of use the entire recruiting process before you even know that somebody's going to get an offer. To, to really start to recruit the person and close the person as a candidate. So you gotta kind of walk a fine line there, right? Which is why I think it's super important to really start the process at the top of the funnel in terms of sourcing and figuring out how to unearth that talent early. Thanks, Wahab. All right, I've been given the five minute warning that I'm standing between you and your lunch. So <laughs> here's what I would like to do. Does anyone else in the audience have a question? Raise your hand if you do. So what I would like to do is I would like, do I see two people? Two? Are you raising your hand back there? Do I see two people? Okay, so panelists, I apologize. I hope this isn't too stressful, but I would love for each one of you to give an answer in 30 seconds or less to these questions that are these last two questions that are going to come up. And you can decline if you don't want to give the 30 seconds, but if you do talk, I request that it be 30 seconds or less. Not pressure. <laughs> Okay, so really quickly, I thank you for sharing the information mm -hmm. on the recruiting and how we'd get through selection, et cetera. Are you seeing from any of the companies who've integrated AI a improvement on retention? I think it's really too soon to tell, right? I mean, I think that a lot of our performance metrics that we look at, um, just the amount of time that it takes for, to hire somebody, um, it, not only to hire somebody to, but to start to see ROI on that investment, it's a while, right? I mean, I think we're talking, you know, 18 to 24 months down the road with some of these investments. Um, so it's good to have those numbers. Um, I've seen companies that have deployed at scale AI that it's been their single biggest way to save and retain employees because the chat conversation not only went through the recruiting conversation it went through and started to ask the candidate after they started a week after they started how's it going right because if you're with a bad boss or a bad team or something's not working out to be able to have the chatbot say you know how's it going and you're like it's not good 
well, we need to get you into something different, right? You're onboarded, you're trained, you're in the benefit system, you're in payroll, and sometimes those simple changes as a basic follow-up. So making sure you're working with the technology that thinks more about the whole life cycle of the candidates versus just recruiting will really help with retention. Right. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. Did we have a final question? That's okay. You're up. Hi. Um, so, quick question. You mentioned that machines have the possibility to take some of the jobs that we currently have. Do you think that women and people with disabilities, especially for the hard of hearing people, will be further sidelined? What is the solution to ensure that they are not sidelined and they get more equal participation in the job market? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the obstacles and sort of uh, maybe challenges that we discussed earlier. You know, AI, I guess, has the, the, the power to save a lot of time. And I would argue that some of that time needs to be um, used to unearth diverse talent. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, diverse talent is however you'd like to define it. And so gender is a big area. Um, ethnicity and race is another big area. And if recruiters have more, who can spend more of their time doing things that don't scale to unearth extremely talented people and bring them through the process in a high touch way, I think it can be a benefit. And that's sort of like the, the collateral of, hey, I've been able to save a lot of time with this, with this AI. Um, but now I can utilize that time um, for folks who, who, who perhaps uh, may have fallen through the cracks. I would just say that, that AI, I think, can really help eliminate the bias. I mean, I think it can, can eliminate, you know, are you, you know, a woman? Are you a man? Are you, you know, like all of those questions. There are things that you can put in to, to filter out. And each company is going to have sort of a different standard. But I think, you know, we're moving toward an environment where people are less and less tolerant of people who are being biased. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this is, this is one foot in front of the other, one step forward. And, I mean, I think it's really an exciting time where, you know, sort of the sky's the limit as we become less biased ourselves and, and more open. That'll be a reflection in, in the programs and the software that we develop. I totally agree. You all set? All right. So with that, I would like to thank our panelists, Jennifer, Wahab, Doug, and Jared. And thank you all for being part of our commentary today on Humanity Works and AI and recruiting. Thank you. Awesome job, guys. Fantastic job. Fantastic job. Fantastic. Still on the mic. I'm just thanking them. It's all good. Housekeeping. Um, we have, for the people in the room, we have a one hour break. For the people at home, that's 60 minutes. Um, and uh, I know, right? But you do kind of have to, anyway, it's like English to French, French to, anyway. So, um, panel, Alex, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Um, one of the things that, um, that Alex also has a connection to College Recruiter is that she's a member of our um, content um, expert panel. So when we have you know, questions, we need a quote from somebody who knows something about something, um, then we will reach out to Alex. It's a, believe me, from me, it's an easy um, bar to jump over when it comes to, to, to that. Um, so we're gonna have, the, the lunch is gonna be right outside here in the room. Um, come back in in an hour. Um, two more things. Um, did everybody get one of these, the Zap Info cards? Okay, they're on the registration desk. Um, Doug and Lynette can talk more about this. So this is a tool um, that this guy introduced me to over a couple of beers, um, which I can be bought easily. Um, and, oh, hell yeah. Um, so it had a different name, which I won't go into at the time. It was something like Voldemort or something, the name that must not, must not be maimed. Um, but seriously, if you do a lot of like copying and pasting of contact information, whether it's LinkedIn or ATS or whatever, um, which at times I do, this many, many days saves me an hour um, of, of work, um, which is worth faith $12 a year for my time. Is that about? So it pretty much pays for the license fee, uh, my time. Um, so anyway, have a look at that. Is it a, is it a free? This is a free trial. It's a free trial, so do that. Um, 
And in an hour, report back on John Sumzer, who's the gentleman with the red glasses and the ponytail. It is San Francisco. We had to have somebody up here with a ponytail that wasn't a female. Um, and he's going to be um, leading a discussion and either kind of completely blowing up everything that we've heard already um, today or maybe affirming uh, a few things. Those of you who haven't had the pleasure of hearing John speak, if you thought that your mind was kind of you know, blowing purple smoke earlier today, um, it will do that. So see you all back in an hour.
Yep. Oh yes. man, yeah, Kyoto, Kyoto was better. Kyoto is better. Yeah, we should talk about the food. Yeah. All right, everybody, if we can get uh, everybody I, I seated. You would have, yeah, you would have died for it. We have our closing keynote coming okay. up. I do. <sighs> All right, welcome back. Um, again, I'm Stephen Rothberg. I'm the founder of College Recruiter, which believes that every student and recent graduate deserves a great career. Uh, job search site, we're headquartered in Minneapolis. Um, our CEO is the ginger at the back of the room, um, Faith Rothberg, um, better known as Stephen Rothberg's boss, uh, both on the personal side and on the work side. Um, the closing keynote at uh, today's boot camp, um, uh, hosted by Google on artificial intelligence, is going to be delivered by um, my longtime friend, John Sumzer. Um, John, um, I've seen him speak um, probably half a dozen, maybe 10 times in person, and he's just one of the most thoughtful people out there. There are a lot of presenters, um, me included, that will pull information together that we read articles, see something, see somebody else speak. One of the things that I love about John is that he's the, he's the person who creates a lot of that content. Um, he's actually gone out and met in person and interview and dug into a lot of the vendors that say that they're using AI. Um, it'll be interesting to see um, if you have thoughts on whether any of that is true, to what extent, I suspect we'll hear that. Um, so John is going to be delivering um, the closing keynote, then we're going to go into the panel discussion, and then um, we'll, we'll wrap up for the day in, I don't know, an hour and a half or something like that. So thank you. So I get to go? Thanks, wow. Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, everybody, for turning up. Thanks, Google. Um, anybody else I need to thank? Oh, God, where do you see this panel? Holy crap. I just want to get to the panel because it's four of the most cantankerous and opinionated people I know. Um, and they don't agree on anything, <laughs> right? And so I'm hoping to organize a food fight with them once I'm done with my little spiel here. Uh, so. So I'm M. John Sumser, and I run something called HRExaminer.com, which if you're not familiar with, please, please stop by the website. We publish two or three interesting articles every week about the edges of HR um, and an annual analysis of the state of the art of intelligent tools in, in uh, HR technology. I use the phrase intelligent tools advisedly. I have yet to see any AI. Um, in the place, there's a lot of machine learning and that's, that's math, right? And it's very interesting math, but there's nothing intelligent about it. What, what machine learning does is it learns all about the past and synthesizes the past into something that you can use today, but it's only as good as the past. It's absolutely only as good as the past. And, and what I'm looking for in intelligence is something that's able to imagine a future and help you navigate the future. So my deal with these sorts of talks is I always want to tell you what the takeaways are so you don't have to stay awake for the rest of the talk. Um, <coughs> and there are five things. If you get two or three of them, it's worth your time. The first one is that models are simplifications. And so everything that you see in intelligent technology is some mathematical model of some reality. And it's always going to be less comprehensive than the reality itself. And the theory is that all you really need to do is get a model up to the point where the result stream is good over time. But the risk in using models to understand things is that you miss factors that you don't understand right now. And being in the early stages of this technology, there's a high likelihood that we don't have the slightest clue about what we're doing and we're making some pretty big mistakes. And so the idea that models are simplifications is a reminder of something that's the third piece here, which is machines have opinions. It was the case up until four or five years ago that you put data into the machine and what came back out of the machine was your data. 
What happens today is you put data into the machine or the machine collects data in some way. And what comes out is that data filtered through a data model, right? And so the data model is the machine's opinion. And like all opinions, you need more than one of them to make a decision. You can't trust a machine to have the right opinion. You can't, you shouldn't, it's a bad idea. Um, we're at a stage where having really good questions is way better than having answers. And that's a change in management, it's a change in the way that we think about work. You know, a lot of the stuff we've heard about today is based on the idea that work is something that you can precisely define. And when you get it precisely defined, you can understand exactly who would go into that precisely defined thing. Well, let me tell you, if you can precisely define it, it's going to be automated. Right, and so, so that work of precisely defining stuff is really the first stage in the automation of, of layers of work. And what happens is that people have to sit back and watch that when you automate work that way, and that's how we're gonna do it over the next 50 or so years, we're gonna automate by understanding better and better what people do. Um, you have to watch it, you have to supervise that process, and one supervises that process by having good questions, not by having answers, because the machine is in the process of getting the answers. It's always gonna be the case, you know, we have a kind of an interesting example of this at the national level right now where paying attention to the details is a, is a complete and inherent part of decision making. And so one of the things I'll talk about is the importance of paying attention to fundamentals. <laughs> and the last thing is, it's not, it's not really holacracy, but what we're going to be managing is as different from the industrial world that our management models are built on as the industrial world was from the agricultural world that preceded it. And so we're going to have to learn how to think about management in radically new ways fairly quickly because the very first thing that we have to manage is these machines who are somewhat intelligent. So we're here talking about talent acquisition. One of the things I do every year is give a, um, um, orientation talk at the HR Tech Conference. And so when, I, when it comes to talking about talent acquisition, this is the slide I use. There are, there are 30 observable areas in which software is being developed as a part of talent acquisition, right? So when you hear the idea that what's gonna happen is we're gonna build a single system that does all of these things or that what you're gonna do in your company is link all of these things together, it requires a level of expertise that I don't think most companies have, right? These are like spices in the spice cabinet, and you have to know whether you're cooking Mexican or Indian or Thai uh, before, <laughs> before you go into the cabinet and start building stuff. So, isn't that pretty? God, I love fruit salad. I love a big bowl of cold fruit salad in the refrigerator. And the thing that I like most about it is how all of the pieces of fruit taste good together. When a machine analyzes this to see what it is, it gets this. Um, it's fantastic. It gives you a count of all of the fruits and all of the pieces. Um, and you'll notice that the bowl has polka dots. And there's a pile of polka dots on the side, right? That, that, kind of, that kind of error is the first kind of error that you see here. The other thing is that there was a decision made about what to count. And if you're like me and you really love fruit salad, what you know about fruit salad is it's the juice in the bottom. That's the whole thing. That's the best part, particularly when it gets a little bit of whipped cream in there. Ooh. <laughs> they didn't count juice. <laughs> right, right, and so the model was simplified because the model adequately allows you to write the next recipe, except for the messy thing about cutting a bowl and a spoon and a pile of polka dots by a third. You could figure out how to cut this recipe by 66% and make a smaller batch of it. It just doesn't get at the thing that's most wonderful about fruit and fruit salad. 
which is the experience of the fruit and the fruit salad. So this is, this is a problem that every single data model has. And this is a problem that every single mathematically engineered machine learning model has, is that it only looks at what's measured, right? And so you make early decisions in your process about what you're managing and measuring, and that's the limits. That's the limits. So the place where these things make errors is in the juice, is in the things that don't get measured, is in the things that you have to have to make the things that are measured go together, right? And so that's the fruit salad. That means, right, what this is, is the machine's opinion of what the fruit salad is. That's the opinion right there. That's the opinion. The machine has this opinion. Um, and if you just took all of those pieces, you'd get something close to a fruit salad, but you wouldn't get a fruit salad because it wouldn't have the juice. Um, and so, so the question that you have to ask when you're overseeing these tools is what's missing, right? What is this thing doing because it doesn't have all of the bits of data that it needs to have a comprehensive view of the universe? Now, maybe it doesn't need a comprehensive view of the universe, but maybe it does. And that's the question that you have to ask about each data model that you encounter. This gets crazy. Um, you know, we were talking about GDPR earlier in the day. There is a new, does everybody know about the new California privacy law? It's kind of GDPR for California. And what it means is that every company in the United States is going to have to ab abide by GDPR level criteria in their privacy things. And that gets right at who owns the content. It's my resume in your database. It's my resume in your database. And, and is it? So I've been wrestling with, with analogies. Um, and, and I don't have any good ones yet, but, but sort of like if I fall out of an airplane into your snowbank and I get up and walk away, who owns the imprint? Right. That's the, that's the question here is my data in your system has some sort of an impact. And if I want it removed, if I want to exercise my ownership rights, how far into your data does my ownership extend? Because you built on the basis of me. Real problem, real question, it's going to be an issue. Um, uh, then after that, who owns the insight that's inside of the thing? Do the people who wrote the algorithms own the insight? Do the people who write so? So if you buy from a vendor and their analysis of your data gives you some insight, is it their property, is it your property? Whose property is that insight? And, and what's owned and ownable in that? And then this whole universe of, who owns the data is, it's way more in play than you'd think. And, and it's not like it was. We got here in a process where employers owned everything about the employee. Uh, you know, it's, it, there's 150 years ago, slavery was outlawed, but we've, we've continued the ownership of human beings pretty consistently. A lot of the models we used to think about management have to do with ownership. We call talent assets or capital. This is all part of a change that's going to happen where we learn how to think about people as something other than property. The next piece of this is who makes the decision. So imagine that you've got a thousand resumes, you put them into one of these machine learning hoppers and, and a hundred resumes pop out the bottom and you move on there from go, who made the decision? Who cut, who cut those people? Was it the vendor or was it you? And if there is an error in that process that results in some sort of civil liability for discrimination, say, is that your problem or theirs, right? So there's a, there's a really big opening question about who's got the liability in this whole thing. And, and I'll tell you that the software companies will all say the employers have the liability. Um, and and I'm starting to hear that software companies won't sign licenses where they accept responsibility for their data models. But 
If they don't accept responsibility for their data model, it's, it, I can't imagine that this business is going to go very far because um, you, can't ask the, you can't ask the customer to take responsibility for your thinking unless they have the ability to change it. So this who has liability question, one of the people on the panel is Heather Bussing, who has a, a whole fistful of opinions about who has liability and employment decision making. And we'll talk about that some more in the panel. But this question again is who owns the result? Like, you know, it's, it's maybe a little easier to understand if a Tesla runs over somebody, is it Tesla's fault or the driver's fault? That same ethical question is going to percolate through all of the places where we bring intelligent tools into our systems. So the last piece that I'm going to leave you with is we're headed into a time where managing intelligent tools is going to be what we do. And it's different than managing people. And it's different than anything that you've ever heard about. So. <laughs> It's my view that within five or six years, most mm, scaled companies will have a library of data models for each person. And there might be 10 or 15. One of them might have something to do with attention, retention and attrition. Promotability might be a track. Um, learning gaps. And each one, of these, each one of these models is probably going to be the product of some process that isn't inherently directly aligned with all the other processes. So the models are going to have differing opinions about the person. It'll be a committee of machines with differing opinions about the person. So that's the first thing. We have to figure out how to use that data that'll have conflicts in it. It isn't any different than managing um, 360 degree feedback kinds of things. You have a bunch of different opinions that you have to wait somehow. But there's this next thing, which is that all data models wear out. They wear out. And they wear out in the following way. When you build a data model, it's set to learn something. And it turns chaos into order. Over and over, it turns chaos into order. That's what they do. Eventually, the environment has lots of order in it. And when it gets lots of order in it, it stops learning. And when it stops learning, all sorts of bias can float in from places that you have it. And what you want to be able to do is figure out how to keep the model learning. Um, and so when it wears out, like a pair of tires, you have to replace it. So now you're talking about 10 or 15 data models per employee, plus replacements, plus some work on what does it take to make the models better. And that looks, that starts to look like, well, this thing is an incubator for um, stem cells, right? You, and, and so it holds like 5,000 test tubes and you incubate, the you incubate the stem cells inside of these specialized tools. I think we're gonna have things like that. And I've seen some early work like that where every data model has a set of attributes that you're monitoring about it. And when the dashboard indicates that the data model is not as useful as it might be, there's a replacement being developed underneath it. And these can be relatively automated processes, but we're gonna to have to learn how to think about them and learn how to deploy them. So I didn't hear this earlier in the day. The whole key here is that if your data isn't governed properly, you're shit out of luck. Excuse me. Out there, I'm sorry if your kids heard that. <laughs> the last decade or so of SaaS software wasn't something that you could um, tailor to your use, but you could customize workflows like nobody's business, and you could name fields like nobody's business. And, and so, if you go out and look in your organizations, it's not unusual to find recruiting departments with a couple hundred different workflows with um, different nomenclature for the same thing across all of those workflows. And a, and a learning system can't learn anything 
when the same thing is named differently. There's some tools emerging that might help with that, but they're a little, little far away. If you want to get started with this stuff now, you have to do a data governance process. And the data governance process looks like getting all of the stakeholders who have names for stuff together to the point where you can make decisions about standardizing on names for stuff so that you can start having um, larger volumes of data to solve problems with. So the very first thing that you have to do to really get this going is take care of and manicure your data. And the second thing is you have to have a problem to solve. This was covered pretty well during the day. Having a problem to solve, I don't know. It's how I learned how to use spreadsheets and that sort of thing is not by understanding what they do, but by trying to do something with it. And so having an internal problem that you're trying to solve is a much better way of getting down the road with, with these tools. So it says, it says um, arigato on the, on the top because I was in Japan all last week and I'm a little uh, jet lagged from it. Um, but, but one of the things I learned that I want to leave you with as a, as a closing thought is HR and recruiting both are radically different based on the problem set that you're trying to solve. And so in Japan, annual attrition is about 4% and people make two or three job changes over the course of their life. And so the volume of resumes and the volume of work is much more compact. Second, branding in Japan is almost always about what a great place our company is to work because alliance to organizations is, is a big deal. So if you were to take American views of recruiting to Japan and try to teach them how to do employment branding, they're already doing it. Teach them how to do volume management, they don't have the problem. Um, <laughs> and so, so what I learned is that something I've always thought was true, recruiting is at least culturally specific and probably specific to your company. And so what you have to watch as this technology rolls out is the way that, the way that vendors have to organize to make money is by believing that there's a standard set of answers to a standard set of problems. And the way that you have to differentiate competitively is by not believing that. And so there's an inherent tension in the relationship that you're going to have with providers of this technology. So with that, I'm going to ask my esteemed panel to come up. And while they're coming up, I'm going to introduce them. So Jeff Dunn, who is looking very Intel-like, happens to be the guy who runs Intel's college recruiting operation. Heather Bussing, who I know personally, um, because <laughs> I'm married to her, um, <laughs> is, is an employment attorney. And, you know, she, she also, I, I, I don't know how many of you would follow something like this, but she wrote the research at Burson on engagement. So she is a, a phenomenal engagement expert as well as that. Richard Rose now, it took me a while to understand Rose now, two syllables, runs people analytics for Facebook. And he, if you, if you haven't run across Richard yet, um, he's passionately dedicated to expanding the universe of people who understand and care about people analytics. Um, and so uh, make it a point of following him on Twitter or something because, because he's doing something that you need to know about. And then Derek Zeller, is there anybody in here who doesn't know who Derek Zeller is? <laughs> Derek, Derek Zeller, huh? Yeah, sorry, nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, his middle name is The Man. Uh, <laughs> and he currently, uh, besides being a writer, he currently does recruiting solutions and channels for engaged talent, which is a company that does the most interesting thing. They can predict the likelihood that you will be willing to take my call about a new job without knowing anything about the insides of your company. Um, and, so, and so they have this theory that a company is, you, you know how microphones work, you can talk into them, but you can also use them as a speaker. The sound will come out of a microphone. They think that companies are like that too, that internal processes are visible externally if you just understand what data to look at.
And so it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. So let's start. See, these are all the questions. You can tell if you want to go or not. Um, <laughs> so, so Jeff's question is, and, and, and the way we're going to do this is, is the named person gets tossed the ball, and then it's a food fight after that. All right. right? And, and let me give you the, actually, you can pick who assaults you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Salad, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Whipped cream, whipped cream. Uh, so, so the question is, every everybody who's built a resume in the last twenty five years has been coached in how to beat the system. And there's a there's a pretty solid argument that the reason that you have resumes is so that you can beat the system. And now there's new evaluation tools in place that are not keyword oriented. How do you coach people how to beat the system? So it's it's a moving target. First of all, the the idea of just putting in some keywords so that it comes up in your search results is is going to go away as these models change. So it's more of loading up the resume with words and phrases and all the synonyms we've been talking about. It's showing results and accomplishments and more numbers. Um, if you don't know exactly what the system is trying to catch, you're going to dump more in so you have more likelihood of sticking and that it's going to come up on somebody's radar. Um, it also involves not only just putting down what you think they're looking for, but it's going and doing some intelligence gathering, going to talk to people who are putting these together and saying, tell me about your company culture. Tell me what you're looking for. Tell me what your process is. And so networking, everyone knows, you know, when you're looking for a job or you're looking to fill a job, networking becomes uh, even more important than it is now because you want to connect to those people that in some cases will completely bypass this screening evaluation process and get your resume on the decision maker's desk. So what you're saying is if you want to be an AI system, you need to talk to a person. Yes. <laughs> Anyone want to add on to that? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I've, I've, I've coached um, college kids. I've coached military, coming out of the military. I tell them all the same thing. The resume is A, yours. It's not a legal document. It's, just, it's, it's your information, so you can put anything you want on there. But until you go to the application, then that's where they're going to get you. So if they don't match up, that's gonna. That's that's bad. So the number the number two thing though is a resume is a key to open the door to get an interview with either the recruiter or with the manager. So you really want it to be tight. You really want it to be succinct. You if you have been in the business as long as I have, you may have a two page resume or a three page resume. I don't tell people to go over over really over three. I mean I've had a very long storied career. When you're coming out of college, there's just ways of putting things like you don't need to put up that you got the degree. I already know you got the degree. Tell me what you did when you were um, uh, interning. What did you do in the internship? Was it all you? Were you part of a group? What part of the group was it? Information is power. The more information you can give a recruiter in a succinct way, the easier it is they're going to want to talk to you. I think I really struggle with this question. And I, I think it's partially, I, I could see a future where we head towards more honesty in the market. Uh, because of AI tools, because there's a bit of an arms race going on where it's a kind of coaching and then we kind of try to get around the coaching. We kind of go back and forth between the company and the talent and the company and the talent to try to kind of game the systems back and forth. But the, the benefit with a lot of these AI tools is you've got a scale that we've never had before and you're able to look at a lot of different things that were never able to be kind of consumed before and brought into one place. And so I, I think ultimately where this is going is that as it becomes so big and the scale becomes so large as a candidate, it, it's going to get past what's manageable for me as a candidate to game anymore. And once we get past that point, there, there's gonna be a little just more honesty in the job market here, I think, where you'll get to a point where companies will be able to see the talent market, be able to find the people, people will be able to find the companies they're looking forward to. Um, so I, I see a brighter future with the kind of direction that's heading and, and a little bit less of the kind of the man versus machine and a little bit more of a don't, don't democratized you, Don't place. you imagine that there's gonna be a vendor next week who says, oh, here's all the cultures, here's how they do the evaluations, we've reverse engineered their uh, data models, and so give us your resume and we'll get it into their systems. Yeah, I, I think so. Right. And then I think there'll be kind of a, a way to fight back on the other side. I, I think about um, people that were putting white text in the back of their resume. Uh -huh. That was a big thing for a very long time. Just every skill you could think of, put it in the white text and 
it humans works. can't see it, but the machines can. Right. But eventually the machines figure that out. And they say, okay, that, we're, we're gonna get rid of that kind of background text. They're, they're starting to use it a little bit differently. I mean, it, you can fool them for a little bit. There's, there's always a window. And then you kind of, that arms race continues. And I think it's at some point, it's gonna get outside of the, the bounds of what humans can continue to keep up with. And I think that's gonna be a bit of a relief for a lot of candidates in the market. Okay. Good, I, think, uh, I have no opinions. Good. Derek, hey, Derek. <laughs> yeah, well, th this should be a first. <laughs> <laughs> so, Derek, um, uh, we've got these intelligent tools running amok in the operation. When can we let them run on their own? Oh, boy. We're going to have it. <laughs> you already had this discussion, John, and I'm glad you asked the question. I don't. I equate this, I equate things to, to, to bring it down to a level where everybody can kind of understand it. So I look at it, this is that AI just was born. Machine learning has been around for a long time, but it's starting to grow. So it, it, it's, we're in the infancy of this, just like we're in the infancy with social media. We're seeing a lot of things change in the last five years. I'm seeing machine learning learning, but as you raise a child, you don't just put a 10 year old in charge of themselves for dinner. You don't give it, you show them how to use the oven. You show them how to use a knife. You explain to them the tools. You hold their hand when you're not there, when you're going to school, you'd say, what do we do? We look both ways, right? These are all things that we're learning. So we're teaching the machine. Eventually, I think that a machine will always need to be monitored. Because as my grandmother once told me with my mom when I was fighting with her when I was 16, she said, son, you have to understand, you're always gonna be her little boy, okay? <laughs> to this day, I talk, I talk to my mom every week. And you know why? Because she, if I don't, she calls me and why didn't you call me? She wants to know what's going on with my life. And I still and I still call her and ask her questions about life, about relationships. What should I do about this? What should I do? What do you think about this, mom? And that's what I think we're always gonna be with machine learning. If we let it go, then I'm seeing a cybernet. Then I'm seeing a cybernet. Cool, cool. Anybody else? I do have opinions on this. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I actually agree with you. I, I don't think you can ever turn hiring people over to a machine, especially if people are going to be working with other people. Um, you know, the, the human factors. Machines, machines are really good at things that you can quantify, and, and humans cannot be defined at that level level ever um, we are we are qualitative messes um, as it should be and so I I just think that if if you are asking machines to give opinions about who should be hired to work with somebody else you better make sure that those opinions are useful and and actually work and and as your teams change, as you change, as your company grows, as, as the things, as technology changes, how we work and what we're doing, all of that has to evolve with human supervision. So, so I just want to beat this around a little bit. Most of the solutions that we heard about today, um, you take a great big stack of resumes, you put them in, and out comes a little small stack at the bottom. Right, and it's scale, right? It's a thousand to a hundred or a thousand to ten that you're talking about. Just exactly who's going to supervise that, right? You're certainly not going to hire people to go back and double check every decision that the machine made. So you have to. You, you have, have to. to. You have legal liability to make sure that that stack of ten is not discriminating against protected classes. That's that's an interesting assertion. I I, I think I have a so I, I think something else to think about here is that I don't see AI replacing exactly what recruiters do. So taking the, the stack of resumes and finding the candidate, they, they might eventually be able to do that. I think where they really succeed today is being able to take a million resumes that recruiters weren't able to look at and surface if there's any gems in there. Oh, and that's so interesting. Taking a look at not, not replacing the recruiter, but augmenting or being able to kind of serve up like, hey, you, you passed on a lot of these people, but this one might actually be someone you might want to take another look at. I think that's where we see a lot of benefit and maybe a little less of that kind of like ethical crunch of like, are we replacing somebody? Are we getting humans out of the equation? By really tackling a slightly different problem that humans are not qualified to do. I think, I think 
that's something that I keep running across in, in my, my looking at, at AI is that the real value is not some cost savings today. The real value is that we're going to be able to do things that we weren't able to do before. And that's, that's hard to sell in contemporary management structures, but it's where we are, where we are. The, the idea that there's an ROI on this stuff, Stephen, you'll appreciate this. The idea that there's an ROI on this stuff is a misplaced way of thinking about it. If you look to use this stuff as cost savings, you'll put yourself out of business. Um, all right, next question. Who, who's liable? <laughs> The employer is liable for its hiring decisions full stop. It does not matter what technology you use. Um, so if your technology is biased or offering discriminatory sets of 10 resumes as the top choices, um, you are the one who's responsible for that. And you're responsible to the people who are being discriminated against in a disparate um, impact case that can be brought by them or by a government agency. And if you discriminate against someone specifically, you could be liable to them. Now, hiring cases are very hard to prove um, because most people who are discriminated against never know that they were. Um, but but when when you start to see the numbers in your company change, um, people will notice. So it's, you know, even if you are not required to track your demographics under federal contracting requirements, everyone who uses technology in hiring should be tracking their, their ratios and, and making sure that they're in disparate impact compliance. So I'm going to skip by. Did you really say that you can't hold the vendor accountable for the quality of their work? I did work? not say that, but that depends <laughs> on what the contract is, how the courts are going to enforce those kinds of contracts, um, and whether there's some sort of civil workaround if the if the vendors have a very clear indemnity or, or re release of liability as part of the sales agreement. But we're get, we're going to see a lot more contractual litigation over these issues, but it, it'll be it'll be determined based on contract law, probably. So, do you think contract law is going to evolve? What AI produces is evidence in reams. Yes, it does. Discoverable evidence in reams that didn't used to be there. So, so if I have a hint that there's something hinky in your hiring process, and I can get an attorney to set up a case then I can discover the data in your recruiting system and do all sorts of things with it. Yes, yeah? yes. Evidence is much easier to acquire <laughs> and analyze now. <laughs> yes, it is. Right. Every, it's, it's not just data, it's evidence. Right. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting point with uh, why AI in this sentence really stands out. Because I think as it stands today, there, there may be bias or, or there, there is bias in, in most companies' hiring systems, but it's not discoverable. And so the unfortunate thing is, even if the AI may have less bias than your current system, if it's discoverable, then suddenly there's, there's a barrier there that didn't exist before. And so I, I would love to see that kind of um, legal environment evolve somehow to yep. allow for more experimentation in that kind of AI space. Because I, I think it, frankly, has the potential to be a lot better than what's going on in the human-based systems today, which you cannot discover, you cannot track, you cannot understand in the same way. And um, I, again, I think we're, we would be in a better world if we could understand the bias in a very quantitative way. Uh, by using AI systems. So one of the things that concerns me in, in terms of diversity is the fact that if I try to match a key set of attributes to my leadership or my top performers, and those leaders are all white males, maybe what comes out of the machine is all white males. And I need to, I need to account for that. Cool. Okay. Maybe the last question, Richard. You don't get the question that's on here. Uh, sure. <laughs> you, did the, you did this to yourself. <laughs> that's fair. So, so Amazon just canned a long project because they couldn't get, in my view, they couldn't get the bias implicit in the history of their company 
out of the data, and so they couldn't build an intelligent system that would be free from bias. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting story. And if anyone hasn't had a chance yet, take a look at the kind of articles that kind of swarmed around that. It came out a couple months ago. Amazon had been running a some kind of system. I think it's a little bit unclear whether or not the system was enacted. I, I didn't think it was. I, I don't think it was. I, I think production. it was a group of engineers that were thinking about or working through. And this is just me speculating at this point because I don't have inside information over there. Um, but I, I think it's interesting that they shut it down. And I think it's more to do with that discoverability than it is to do with the actual effectiveness of what they were looking through. Because um, I, I do think that Amazon, with nearly 500,000 employees now, they must get millions of resumes every year, absolutely millions. And to be able to look through all of them, they have to find a way to scale recruiting. And, and to think through, I, I know um, the Alio team here, they, they've done the kind of math on kind of how many recruiters would it take to look through a million resumes, and how could we kind of replace that with a scaled solution. I, I think they do need something like that. It, it was a bit of a, a step back, I think, from a uh, kind of media perspective and just the space in general. Um, because it really, it, it took a hit from kind of this Amazon is hiring men or their, their history is based on men, so this is what they're doing. And it just kind of took off from there. Um, but I think what they were doing was the right effort in the right way. And I think they shut it down before it kind of got too bad. But um, I think going forward, they, they could have really had a lot more success there. And I, I don't think this is the end of that space. Mm -hmm. And companies kind of looking into this to try to see how can we scale recruiting? How can we find these candidates in the rough? Um, yeah. You know, the, the theory is that you can eliminate bias, right? The, the, the theory is that you can eliminate bias. And, and it might be the case that bias is just like a steady breeze and you got you to tack against the steady breeze to go in a yeah. straight line and that you can mitigate bias and you can mitigate the impact of bias. But the idea that what you can do is prevent human beings from having a point of view and keep that out of their data, that seems... That seems like an extravagant hope to me. Yeah, and I, I think that goes back to that augmentation piece. Uh, I think if Amazon was hoping to replace and get rid of recruiters, um, I, I would hope that that's not where their head was at with it. I, I think um, experimentation in this area, though, should be uh, expanded, and we continue to kind of work in that space and continue to innovate there. Um, because the, the worst thing that could happen is we just say, full stop, let's just keep recruiting with humans as we are today and just scale mm -hmm. that and just hire thousands and thousands of recruiters. I'm sorry to the recruiters in the audience. Um, I, I know it's, a, it's, it's something that we're going to need forever, but at the same time, something's got to change eventually here, especially when you get to that scale. I'm, I'm going to weigh in real quick. I have a, a really, is a very good friend, very dear friend. He runs a company called Aspen Advisors, and that's exactly what he does. He goes, he's hired by companies to come in and to tell them what is good and what is bad. And uh, Andrew uh, Gadomsky, I'm going to give him a shout out for the Aspen Advisors. Him and I have chatted many times about this. Um, I've gone through the Myers Briggs dystopian process. Uh, there's just there's all these different wild things that are happening out there. And but the thing is, at the end of the day, and, and Andrew will tell you this, he'll bring you the data, and he just gives you the data. He says he analyzes and he gives it to you, the good and the bad. And he has been told by companies, here's your check, thanks, and they never did a dang thing. Every day. The companies need to step up. We can, I mean, we can, I can go, I can go in and, and evaluate your entire recruiting team. I can come in for two weeks and tell you exactly who should be here and who shouldn't. Just by listening to the conversations. After 23 years, I'm pretty sure I can tell you that. But I gotta have you accept those findings. That's where bias starts. Doesn't start with the machines. It starts with the very top, and if they're not willing to listen and trickle it down, it's never going to change. Awesome. So we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, who wants to toss a hardball at one of these batters here? Grab the microphone. Thank you. Question. Uh... So quick question. So the machine will collect data. Do you think that Privacy policy and privacy law are hollow promises as every prospective employer is going to collect your data. This is especially concerning in the UK where the right to be forgotten exists. How do you ensure that such privacy exists for the years to come? This question is for Heather. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, privacy is a really important right, but it is also one of our most fragile rights and that we can very easily give it up by clicking a box. 
saying I agree. And if you don't know what you're agreeing to, you know, so, so there are some things that laws can do. GDPR, I think is, is an interesting compromise between privacy and usability of data. Um, and, and the, the most important thing that we're going to figure out is, is who has the burden, you know, is it something that the person who has the data must inform you of directly and get your affirmative knowledge and consent? Or is it enough to have a privacy policy on a website, which is where California's new um, data privacy law, that's, that's their basic thing. There are some security things, but, but basically the burden is completely on the person involved to come back and say, what data do you have? And please take it off your website. And most of us have no idea who has our data and what they're doing with it. You know, that it's, it's, it's a pretty clear transaction with the Safeway card, right? They hand me their card. The deal is I get a discount in exchange for my data. I buy all my cost, my toilet paper at Costco. They're still trying to figure out why I don't use toilet paper, you know, and, and I'm, I'm okay with this. I, I'm okay with this. But, but, but for most of these, for most data, the subject has no idea. And, and anonymized data is another approach. But the truth is, is that there's no way to truly anonymize data. Um, it's, it's very easy with almost a tiny bit of context to, to connect it and figure out what's going on. Uh, you, you said companies will just collect data. I, I think that is not true from my experience. And, and I would not be as pessimistic kind of on, on that front there. I, I, I talk to a lot of teams about GDPR because I'm on a people analytics team at Facebook. Um, GDPR is actually part of what I do within my day job is working with that, understanding it better, like figuring out how this applies, how we work with it. Um, it is a massive conversation going on right now. And, and so I, it's something just from the inside I'm, I'm thrilled about to be able to kind of see how that works and see how that plays out. And employee privacy is absolutely at the utmost concern. Because I, I think as soon as one company messes that up, the whole thing comes crashing down about how we understand this, how we can help our employees. It would be a massive step back for the entire industry. And so I think this is something that within the people in the analytics space at least is highly, highly uh, being watched. And let me just add, everybody know what a cookie is? Yep. Not a cookie that we just had after lunch, but the cookies on the website. Has anybody else noticed that all of a sudden the websites that you frequently go to are now giving a pop-up saying, hey, we use cookies? That's GDPR. So when you click okay, then you're saying, okay, you can you can follow every click I do. Okay, I work for a company called Comscore. That's what we did. All, I hired data analytics people for almost three years. And that's all we did is we tracked data specifically for the movie industry. And when you're at home and you're at Comcast and you're clicking the channel and you're like, and the a commercial comes on and you sit through the commercial, I'll know it. Now, I don't know who you are, but I'll collect all that data and I sell it to the advertising agency. That's how Comscore and Nielsen make money. That's what ratings are all about. But you're giving them that information. When you get that cable box, you're telling the cable company in your contract that you signed, they're going to be monitoring all of your information. So that's where it's gonna go down to. And I think probably the key takeaway for corporate HR people is collect the minimum amount of data you need, um, explain what you're gonna do with it, and only use it for that purpose. Yeah. Really? And watch out for Fair Credit Reporting Act. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 really, the, the way to understand an organization is by collecting as much data as you can. That's going to be quite a tough balance to strike. And, and if you imagine being an HR leader going to the CEO saying, we don't want to understand what's going on in our workforce. We're only going to collect the minimum amount of data. I think that's a ticket to a short career. Well, we're, we're purposeful from a recruiting perspective. We, we're not going to use it for other marketing, say, Intel products. We're not going to use it for other. We're not going to sell it to anybody. It's used for recruiting. If you're clicking in our database to apply for a job, it's only going to be for that purpose. Okay. Well, so last bit, then this is to put each of you on the spot. There was, there was some talk earlier in the day about actionable insights. Um, so 
So if you were going to tell somebody one thing to take away from this conversation or today in general or something you learned reading the newspaper in the hotel this morning, <laughs> what would it be? Start with you, Jeff. I think whatever you decide to implement today based on learnings, based on company offerings, put a, put a pin in revisiting it in, in 12 months or less because things are going to change. You can't outsource responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, don't compare AI against the perfect. You, you have to compare it against what you're doing today. And what we're doing today is not perfect. I don't know where uh, yeah, good grief. So you both just stole everything that I was going to say. Uh, all of you, all three of you. Um, I guess my takeaway is this. We're not there yet. I don't think we're close. I really don't. I think I, 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 I don't know. I don't know when. Um, I think we're going at a, we were going at a really fast speed, uh, almost breakneck. And then all of a sudden we hit a wall with GDPR. No offense to Facebook. We hit a wall, some stuff there. We, Amazon hit a wall. Um, once again, like I said, I can give you the information. It's up to you if you want to accept it. And that's that's what I think the next big hurdle is going to be, is because there's going to be people like John out there and bringing you that data, and you're not going to like it sometimes. So how do you deal with it? So just to wrap this all up, a couple of things. One is it would be a reasonable thing to take away from this conversation that you should stay away from this crap for as long as you can. And, 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 and I urge you not to do that. I urge you not to do that. This is the way that work is going to be from here going forward. It's going to be less certain. It's going to be less clear. It's going to be more experimental. This is what a flattening of the hierarchy looks like. And it's going to be augmented with technology. And so what you have to do is get your feet wet and try things and, and try things to the point that there's some risk to you associated with those things because that's how your companies are going to survive. You got to get in, you got to get in now, even though it's uncertain, even though it's, it's something other than perfectly clear, this is the make or break it for your company. And, and, and so get started. Second thing is, um, for just the tiniest bit of promotion, we wrote a, an incredible industry analysis at HR Examiner um, that looks at uh, trends and vendors inside of HR. 70% of them are recruiting vendors that we cover. Uh, you might want to stop at the HR Examiner site and see that, and you may want to follow us because we keep a steady pulse of information about the stuff going through there. Lastly, let me remind you who these people are. Derek Zeller. He is the head of recruiting projects at Engage Talent. Richard Rosenau runs people analytics for Facebook. And, and by the way, they have 50 people on the people analytics team at Facebook. 50 people. This is coming to your town. Heather Bussing, uh, employment attorney. And Jeff Dunn, the head of college recruiting for Intel. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Don't, don't, don't sit. Don't, don't sit. Good boy. <laughs> thank you very much, Richard. You have one. All I have right. one. Well, then you have. You already picked them up. Awesome. So we have a couple extra of the um, Humanity Works books by um, Alexander Levitt, if anybody wants. A couple, Thank you. three. Um, Thank fantastic you. panel. Thank great. you guys so much, John. Thank you. Um, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our Jeff, CEO um, from, from College Richard, Recruiter, Faith Rothberg, has a few closing remarks, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we work for tips, so we'll pass. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but I really appreciate it. Um, I was really blown away by the, the, the depth and breadth of the content today, um, people's willingness to share. Um, hopefully in private conversations that some of you had, um, and if you haven't, make sure you do that before you leave. Um, 
the attendees that we get to these boot camps tend to be um, very collaborative, very willing to share. Even if you're recruiting the same talent, um, a lot of times people are, uh, most of the time my experience has been the rising tide lifts all ships um, type of thing. Um, if you want to mark your calendar for the next boot camp, one year from today, we're looking at either DC or New York. So, oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> you and don't get to fly across the country again. But think of the miles you're missing. So thanks, it's babe. right around the same time. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Stephen. So um, I just wanted to take a few minutes um, to talk about what we learned today. It is amazing. One of the ways that uh, I can explain it best is what today felt like for me is something one of my employees always tells me at the end of a really crazy day, and that is I'm seeing purple smoke. Um, there's just, there was so much information today. I felt like information overload. Um, I want to watch it again so I can see what I missed because um, I'm sure I missed a lot. Um, but some of the great takeaways I have for sure today is something I've been talking about a lot, which is that uh, Stephen and I have been in the business for a long time. We've seen so much change and innovation over the years, but what's really um, struck me in the last year or so is how the pace of innovation has changed. I mean, not it, it's just been overwhelming how fast it's changing. And so that was a takeaway for me from this to watch how we're gonna be watching AI and being able to take some baby steps along the way. So in the morning, we learned about how you could use AI to solve some of your mundane sort of processes and allow yourselves to have a much better, um, well, I think more fun job because you can look at the other parts of your job, which are being an ambassador and strategy around making sure you make those great hires and not do some of the mundane work. Um, and if we do that, uh, there is a lot of scary stuff coming out in AI, but if we take those baby steps along the way, then we can use, uh, get comfortable with change for people who aren't and who people who love it, just grab it and run with it. Um, we, uh, one of the things that a big takeaway in the middle of the day was that I thought it was really cool about how HR could actually be, because of all the problems in, in HR tech and, and trying to really hire properly, we want to use um, AI and these innovative tools, we could actually lead the way in HR within our own larger organizations. And um, in that respect, if you can get then your bosses to get on, on the page, you can show how AI can help really uh, get a better ROI and return and end up at, if you're not there yet, end up at the table with those other top executives in the business. Um, and then, I found it fascinating. One of the things that John said in this last presentation about how um, our jobs are gonna be changing to ask questions rather than solve solutions. I, I, I had never really thought about it that way. And I think it's really true. And as you put that together with what he was talking about with governance and the idea that AI can only answer certain things, then our jobs just become different. They don't go away, they become very different. And we manage that data and we manage um, putting those solutions together to come out with the right um, intelligent solution for the whole. Um, and then, uh, lastly, from a, a just a real personal takeaway was that idea that Alexandra um, was talking about with um, how she, she was talking about how uh, in your career, you're going to need to be more flexible and have more skills. And I think that was really interesting and also went along with the idea that we may be able to start taking talent pools and find those rare people in the bottom that we didn't get to because of the way our process works today um, and leverage each other's, um, the leverage the people that you bring in um, that didn't quite fit this job but might really work really well over here for this other hiring manager um, and not lose those great talents because of that. So um, those were kind of my takeaways. I hope that you guys have some things that you can really go back to the office um, and implement or start talking to your teams about. Um, 
I agree with Stephen that there are so many great people in the room here um, that people are willing to share. I hope some of you who I haven't gotten to speak with today will reach out. Um, I certainly will try to reach out to everybody on LinkedIn and um, look forward to seeing people and, and keeping the conversation going. Um, the last thing I really wanted to do was thank uh, Whitney again for just this wonderful event and allowing us to be in her house. And Whitney, we have a gift for you. So if you could come up here a minute, I have a, a little story. We were, we were able to go to a winery this weekend. We went up to Napa and it was with a friend of ours who was in the talent acquisition space for a long time. He retired and what he decided to do in retirement was do two days of wine tasting. Um, so, you know, there's always hope after you're done. Um, but uh, we ended up um, getting to be treated like VIPs and taste all this wonderful wine. And so in the end, what we wanted to do was give Whitney, where did I just put it? Uh, this great bottle of wine from Sterling Vineyards. You know me well. Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. That's so great. Yes, it's pleasure. been so great. So, um, anyway, um, that should do it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, and we're... We, we, it's been great. So um, have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.